didn't go the way it was supposed to go at all. You know, you can't like really function in everyday life if you're looking over your shoulder every second. Every time I hear a siren, I think they're coming for me. On the night of Tuesday, June 20th, 2012, Ashley Biggs set out to make her final delivery pizza for the night at around 11.45 p.m. Little did anyone know, it was going to be Ashley's last ever delivery. Her car and body was found the next day in a neighboring county. It didn't take investigators long to find her killer, but as the years went by, suspicion started to grow and investigators began to believe Ashley's killer had not acted alone. A jailhouse confession and long withheld secret recording would eventually bring a second suspect to justice for Ashley and her family. Who had Ashley made an enemy of? What pushed her killers to take her life so violently? Hello and welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved and twisted cases from around the world. With a population of just under 14,000, New Franklin is a fairly small city in southwestern Summit County, Ohio. It's home to the Portage Lake State Park and the historic Tudor House on the Portage Lake waterfront, famous for its breathtaking vistas. It offers residents a rural and wholesome experience with a fairly affordable cost of living. Its residents are known for being some of the friendliest people one could meet, and they're what gives the town its unique charm. New Franklin ranks 61% safer than other cities in America and often makes the 100 safest cities in the nation annually. And it's for that reason that the death of Ashley Biggs created such a stir. Ashley Nicole Biggs was born on January 9, 1987 in New Franklin, Ohio. She was an only child and was raised by her mother, Kimberly Ann Biggs, and stepfather, Ted Grebenstein. Growing up, Ashley was described as being kind and gentle. She always had a ready smile and was full of laughter. She grew up surrounded by a family that loved her unconditionally. When she was 17 years old, she met 25-year-old Chad Cobb through mutual friends during a double date at a local skating rink. The two had an instant chemistry and began a serious relationship. Ashley and Chad eventually moved in together and a year later welcomed a baby girl named Gracie into their lives. But their relationship started to become strained. Friends would say that Chad was abusive towards Ashley, and he often hit her. Soon after her relationship with Chad ended, Ashley signed up with the U.S. Army in 2008 and gave Chad full custody of their daughter. After serving briefly in the military, she was given a medical discharge due to her severe asthma. When she returned home, she started working as a pizza delivery driver for Domino's Pizza in Akron, Ohio. Ashley had also begun a relationship with another woman named Brittany Dunstan. With a new job and relationship, Ashley decided she wanted to raise her daughter Gracie with her new partner. After a long, drawn-out court battle, Ashley was awarded full custody of Gracie, much to Chad's dismay. This led to Ashley taking out a protective order against Chad after he began threatening the safety of herself and her partner Brittany. It was around 11.42 p.m. on Tuesday night, June 20th, 2012, when a late pizza order came into the Domino's in Akron, Ohio. The woman on the line identified herself as Jen and ordered a half pepperoni, half mushroom pizza. Ashley was on duty as a driver that night and opted to make the delivery. The delivery address would take her to a business area in New Franklin, Ohio. She was given instructions to go around to the back of the building to drop off the order. Ashley left shortly before 12 a.m. The staff expected her to be back within minutes for closing time as the address was nearby and the roads would have been quiet. But over an hour passed, and there was still no sign of Ashley. Her manager then called Brittany, who had not heard from her either. Concerned, the manager then placed a call to the New Franklin Police Department to report Ashley as a missing person. Officers arrived at the Domino's at 1.21 a.m. and spoke to the manager. He explained that Ashley went out to make the delivery over an hour earlier and hadn't returned. Just as police were taking statements from the staff, Brittany arrived at the Domino's to find out what had happened to Ashley. Brittany told officers that she was concerned about Ashley because she was having problems with her ex-boyfriend, Chad Cobb. Police assured them that they'd search for Ashley and drove to Turkeyfoot Lake Road, the address given for the pizza order. When they arrived at the address, situated along a lonely dark road, they noted that it was a business that was obviously closed. 
They searched around the parking lot, but found no sign of Ashley's gray Ford Taurus. What they did find was a large pool of blood and change scattered around the area. Their investigation was now more than just a simple missing persons case. Officers were sure that someone had lured Ashley out to the empty parking lot. They also figured that it might have been someone who knew her and was aware that she was working the late shift that night. Investigators began by interviewing Brittany, Ashley's partner. She told police about Chad and Ashley's bitter custody battle for their daughter, Gracie. Brittany also explained that Ashley had recently taken out a protection order against Chad after he'd made threats against the two of them. Brittany told officers that Chad was not too happy about their relationship and didn't approve of Ashley's bisexual lifestyle. She described Chad as being possessive and jealous and stated that he felt personally offended that Ashley had left him for a woman. He also told Ashley that he didn't like the idea of Gracie growing up under the influence of their lifestyle. Brittany was sure that investigators needed to speak to Chad in regard to Ashley's disappearance. She provided investigators with Chad's details and police were able to find him in their database. It so happened that Chad was charged with assault against Ashley seven years prior. At 3.30 on Thursday, June 21st, 2012, investigators knocked on the door of the home of Chad Cobb. There was no answer and investigators were still waiting to get the search warrant. They ran a background check on Chad once again and found a black Lincoln Navigator registered in his name. However, the address was different and was about half a mile away from the delivery location. Investigators decided to visit the new address and discovered that the property belonged to Chad's grandparents. As they descended on the house, their beams fell upon a black vehicle parked behind the property near a barn. Beyond the barn was a wooded area. When officers looked into the vehicle, they found a woman with four children. It was Chad's new wife, Erica Cobb. Investigators questioned Erica and took her into custody while family members were called to come and get the children. While searching the scene, officers heard noises coming from a nearby wooded area behind a chicken coop. A search team went out into the dark and soon found Chad hiding in the woods in camouflage gear. As he was escorted out towards the waiting police cars, the lights highlighted several patches of blood on his clothes. He was also taken into custody. When officers asked Chad about what he was doing hiding in the woods and what had happened to Ashley, he was uncooperative. Erica also refused to answer any questions and asked for a lawyer. The children were handed over to the care of Chad's grandparents while both husband and wife were taken to the police station. Both refused to speak. Investigators, though, were not sitting idly. A search warrant was being prepared by one team as another returned to the scene of Ashley's disappearance at daybreak. Apart from the pool of blood, investigators also found drag marks in the blood and white paper dots that they knew came from a taser. Their suspicion of an ambush was growing stronger. Meanwhile, a second investigation team executed a search warrant on the properties of both Chad Cobb and his grandparents. In the woods behind the chicken coop, investigators found a backpack with a large knife inside. A neoprene mask, gloves, a taser, duct tape, and industrial-sized zip ties were found scattered on the ground where Chad was discovered. On these items, they found trace amounts of blood. It looked like an assault kit, and investigators were on the verge of getting their big break. Following this discovery, investigators used helicopters and dive teams to search for any trace of Ashley or her vehicle. It seemed like they'd hit a dead end when a call came in from a woman in neighboring Wayne County. The anonymous caller said her house, which was located on a hill, overlooked a cornfield. According to the caller, when she woke up, she noticed something shiny on the edge of the field. She called police believing someone may have been up to no good in the cornfield. When investigators arrived, they found a gray-colored Ford Taurus. It was similar to the vehicle owned by Ashley Biggs. As investigators looked inside, they found the body of a woman lying on the floor of the back seat. It was a bloody scene. The victim had been bound at the wrists and legs with industrial zip ties. She also had a zip tie around her neck. Her face had turned purple from lack of oxygen, and investigators saw several taser wires sticking out from her body. She also appeared to have been severely beaten. The victim was still wearing her pizza delivery uniform. Inside was an insulated pizza delivery bag and the untouched pizza from her last order. Investigators also found delivery stickers from several of the delivery orders made that night, 
including the order made at 11.42 p.m., stuck on the steering wheel. The body was removed and taken to the office of the Summit County Medical Examiner. In order to properly identify the body, investigators called Ashley's mother, Kimberly. She was asked if Ashley had any tattoos on her body, to which Kimberly responded that Ashley had two stars on the back of each arm and a belly button tattoo. They were able to confirm that the body they discovered was indeed that of Ashley. Chad was placed under arrest on suspicion of murder and refused to cooperate with investigators. He was detained at the Summit County Jail. Erica was allowed to go home. Investigators had no evidence that linked her to Ashley's murder. On June 22, 2012, Dr. Lisa Kohler, the chief medical examiner for Summit County, performed Ashley's autopsy. She determined that Ashley's cause of death was due to asphyxiation caused by the zip tie around her neck. Ashley showed signs of blunt force trauma to her scalp, face, and body. She also had defensive wounds on her wrists and back of her hand. Ashley's blood samples were taken and tested against the traces found on Chad's clothes and tools. They were a positive match. After Chad was arrested, Ashley's family and friends spoke to investigators about the years of abuse she endured. Ashley's partner Brittany also revealed that Chad had started harassing, stalking, and threatening violence against the two women after Ashley was awarded full custody of Grace. On Friday, June 24, 2012, Chad Cobb was formally charged and arrested for murder. His bail was set at $1.5 million. A written man accused of killing his child's mother appeared in court today. Chad Cobb was arraigned on aggravated murder and kidnapping charges. In June, police found the body of Ashley Biggs bound and gagged inside a vehicle in New Franklin. Cobb and Biggs shared custody of their six-year-old daughter. Court records show their battle over how often Cobb got to see the child was heating up. Cobb will be back in court later this month. During his arraignment, Chad was informed that he'd be facing the death penalty. Chad agreed to a plea deal with over nine charges that included aggravated murder, aggravated robbery, and kidnapping. On Tuesday, February 26, 2013, Chad pleaded guilty to all the charges against him at the Summit County Common Pleas Court. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It had seemed as if the case had been solved and the killer was now behind bars. However, investigators knew that it was a woman who made the phone call. They knew Chad would have needed a second person to drive his car to the cornfield in Wayne County. This suspicion kept New Franklin detective Michael Hitchings interested in the case well after Chad's sentencing. Investigation I didn't feel was complete because we didn't get the other person. Wholeheartedly, we believed that there was a female involved. We were thinking definitely that somebody else helped him by making the phone call and most likely obviously driving him there because he couldn't have drove both cars out. Suspicion fell on Erica, but there was never any solid evidence that implicated her. When I came in contact with her at the house, first thing Erica said was she didn't want to talk to us out with an attorney. Most people, I would say, would be concerned a little for somebody who's missing. She had no emotions, didn't want to talk about it. So that kind of steered me to believe she was involved from the get-go. During the initial investigation, officers made a rather interesting discovery. They'd found a receipt from a local Walmart for the purchase of a prepaid phone on June 20th, 2012. Surveillance footage showed an image of Chad, Erica, and their children exiting the store. This, however, was not proof that she was in any way involved in the murder. Erica had moved on with her life following the arrest. She filed for divorce from Chad while he was awaiting sentencing and began dating Chad's childhood friend, Mike Stefanko. Erica and Mike eventually got married and had a baby together soon after Chad was sentenced. But betrayal is a bitter pill to swallow and Chad was not a fan of the changes happening around him. When Chad was sentenced, Erica often brought the children to visit him in prison. As the years passed and she became more involved in her new marriage and life, those visits started to dwindle until they became non-existent. Around this time, Gracie, Chad and Ashley's daughter, had started writing him letters in prison. In these letters, she told Chad about the emotional, physical, and mental abuse she faced at the hands of Erica. She often wrote about how unhappy she was living with her stepmother and their new family. Chad was growing increasingly frustrated, and after four years of being in prison, finally, and certainly unexpectedly, he decided it was time to come clean about Ashley's murder. He wrote a letter to Detective Michael Hitchings. In the letter, he confessed to the detective that it was Erica who made the call for the pizza and used the alias Jen. 
He also told Hitchings that Erica was the mastermind of the murder and drove him to the location of the murder in his Lincoln Navigator. Chad added that they needed to speak to his mother, Cindy Cobb, who had evidence that could help their case. This was the break Hitchings and his team of investigators were waiting for. They contacted Cindy, who agreed to meet with them in January 2018, almost six years after the murder. Cindy provided investigators with a recording of a conversation she had with Erica two years after Ashley's murder in March 2014. On the recording, Erica openly discusses the murder with Cindy and confessed that she was not forced in any way by Chad to help lure Ashley out for the fake pizza order. When investigators asked Cindy what made her record the conversation, she told them that it was insurance for her son Chad. It seemed to investigators that Erica had not only made an enemy of Chad, but also of Cindy. Since Erica remarried, she'd started to keep her and Chad's children away from their grandmother, which created a strain. From what investigators had learned about the case, they surmised that the following events led up to the murder of Ashley Biggs. After Chad lost custody of Gracie, he started to grow resentful of Ashley and her newfound lifestyle. He and Erica conspired to lure Ashley out and silence her in order to make their problems go away. Erica made the call to Domino's that fateful night, knowing Ashley was the delivery driver on duty. Erica provided an address in a quiet part of the city that didn't see much traffic at that hour. She then drove herself, the kids, and Chad out to the area to wait for Ashley. The instructions were for Ashley to park in the front of the building and meet the person who ordered the pizza at the back. Unaware, Ashley made her way to the back of the building and was surprised by Chad and Erica. Chad proceeded to taser Ashley and render her unable to defend herself. He then proceeded to zip tie her arms and legs before beating her unconscious. After his brutal attack on Ashley, he then strangled her with a zip tie. Chad then dragged Ashley back into her own car and had Erica and the kids follow him to the cornfield in Wayne County. Once Chad dumped the car along with Ashley's body in the field, Erica drove him back to his grandparents' house. Chad may have expected to get rid of the evidence in the wooded area. However, he didn't expect the police to catch up with him so quickly and was in the middle of scattering the evidence when he was discovered in the woods. Now, armed with a confession, investigators started to develop a case against Erica. However, it would prove to be difficult because the man accusing her was her scorned ex-husband who already took the blame for the murder. But in her very own words to Cindy, Erica admitted to being part of the murder and even assisting. On November 11th, 2019, Erica was arrested and charged with aggravated murder, murder, aggravated robbery, and kidnapping. The prosecution faced an uphill battle as they worked to develop a strong case against her. They focused on the law of complicity. They believed that without Erica's help, Chad would not have been able to go ahead with the murder. This ensured that both Erica and Chad would be found guilty of murdering Ashley no matter what part either of them played. The prosecution also depended on character witness testimony from individuals who knew about the feud between Ashley, Chad, and Erica. A year after her arrest, Erica Stefanko went on trial for her part in the murder of Ashley Biggs. The prosecution's opening statements argued that Erica was a key player in Ashley's murder and that, without her, 
it wouldn't have happened. The state would ask, as you listen to the evidence and testimony, that you keep in mind that a person who knowingly aids, helps, assists, encourages, directs or associates herself with another either for the purpose of committing or in the commission of a crime is regarded as if she were the principal offender and is just as guilty as if she personally performed every act constituting the offense. The state would like that you keep in mind as you listen to the testimony and evidence that when two or more persons having a common purpose to commit a crime and one does one part and the second does another, those acting together are equally guilty of that crime. However, the defense focused on Chad Cobb. They argued that Chad was using this as a way to reduce his own sentence and secure himself an early release date. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a person who after eight years now, after never mentioning it before, until really about 2017, he's stewing in that prison. And now he's trying to get out from under full responsibility. Because he wants to drag somebody else down to his level. He wants to get out of prison early. He wants his sentence shortened. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of person that you are going to try to evaluate. Someone that took the mother of his daughter, ambushed her, beat her, and strangled her. And you are going to determine how much truth is in his statement. Chad Cobb testified remotely about Erica's role in Ashley's murder. This was also the first time he'd said it was Erica who strangled Ashley. Was Ashley already dead? Yes, sir. Did you strangle her? I'm not the one who strangled her, sir. Would you please repeat that? I am not the one that strangled her, sir. I see. So now you pled guilty, and now you're saying that you didn't kill her. Is that right? Yes, sir. Chad and Ashley's daughter, Gracie, was called to testify about her relationship with Erica and the torment she faced at her hands. I remember going to a dance where we had like the matching dress and I remember, I remember having good times, but then I also remember having bad ones. And the bad ones, do you know how frequently or often they were? I don't remember how like often, but I just remember them happening. All right. And what types of things are we talking about that you're remembering? She was mentally abusive and physically. And how was she mentally abusive? She would tell me that if I told my dad what she was doing to me, then she would do worse. And I kind of figure that's like mentally. And you said physically. So what was the physical type of abuse? Um, she would, I remember she would hold me on the ground and she would hit me. And then she also before made me eat dog feces. So let's talk about that. Do you know why she made you eat dog feces? Because she was jealous of my relationship with my father. With, your, with who? With my father. With your father. Gracie also told the court that she remembered Erica making the phone call to order pizza, but couldn't remember the exact details. A friend who wanted to remain anonymous and testified off camera painted a damning picture of Erica's hatred towards Ashley. Um, during the dinner conversation, it wasn't so much about Ashley in that conversation. 
Um, but she had talked about her before. Pretty, she, she really kind of expressed her hate for her. Um, she had talked about, um, and I don't know how, how anybody could do this, but um, she talked about how she had gotten into her email and social media accounts and she could see what was what Ashley was doing, what she was saying, what she knew, um, things like that. Did she talk about after Ashley was murdered, anything she may have done um, in regards to Ashley? Um, she did say that after um, after everything had happened that she would visit Ashley's grave. And at one point I know that she had, um, she had said that she had defecated on her grave. Having heard the witness testimonies and closing arguments from both sides, the jury deliberated for three days before returning to court on November 25th, 2020. They found Erica guilty of aggravated murder and murder but not on the charges of aggravated robbery and kidnapping. In July 2021, Erica was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 30 years. After sentencing, she spoke to Ashley's family and Gracie, telling them that she'd gladly take whatever blame they wanted to place on her if it gave them peace of mind. Your Honor, it, it is healing and helpful to Ashley's family and friends. If it is helpful for Cindy Cobb to exonerate her child for his own actions by putting the blame on me, if that helps these people, particularly people who are victims, I can accept that. I was most certainly my worst self during my relationship with Chad. I have never been a hateful person. I would never have wanted what happened to Ashley Biggs, regardless of what statements people think that they heard on that tape. And all I can do at this point for her family and friends is to Pray for God's peace and comfort for them. In July 2022, Erica's conviction was overturned after the Ninth District Court of Appeals found that her rights were violated by the remote testimony of Chad Cobb. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Chad was forced to testify from a separate courtroom. The appeals court found that it violated Erica's right to a fair trial due process of law, and to confront the witness under the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments of the Constitution. A date for Erica's retrial is yet to be set. In December 2022, Erica requested that her bond be lowered as she awaits a retrial. Prosecutors argued that Erica posed more of a flight risk after she'd been convicted of aggravated murder. Summit County Common Pleas Judge Joy Malik Oldfield upheld Erica's original bond, which was set at $2 million. She remains at the Summit County Jail, awaiting her retrial. Ashley's murder has had a ripple effect on all the people involved in or affected by the crime. Gracie's left without her mother, and now her father, who will never see freedom again. She remains in the custody of her grandmother, Cindy Cobb. Cindy, however, has not seen her other two grandchildren since Erica's sentencing, as her family was awarded guardianship. For Ashley's family and friends, the pain is even worse. They have no relationship with Gracie and have to live with the daily reminder that Chad tore their lives apart with one single selfish act. For Chad and Erica's children, they're constantly burdened by the knowledge of their parents' cruelty that had destroyed so many lives of the people around them. In the end, they too have been left without the guidance of either parent, just like their half-sister Gracie. Chad and Erica's actions destroyed not only their own lives, but that of so many around them. Their actions left their children without parents. And even though Erica may not have been the one to kill Ashley, she was equally responsible and instrumental in her death. So taking all this into account, 
Who do you think were the real victims of this senseless crime? Do you believe Erica deserves to serve a life sentence for her actions? Well, we've been up all night. Um, I was looking out the window watching the children going to school, just thinking she might come back, probably, you know, ready to go to school. She'd stayed at a friend's somewhere that we didn't know of. And um, police come to the door and asked us to sit down and just said, she's dead. We found her. The person you just heard was Kathleen Mann, mother of 15-year-old Linda Mann. It was November 21st, 1983, when Linda Mann went to her friend's house to babysit, but never made it back home. The following day, her lifeless body was discovered on Blackpad Road, Narborough, in the United Kingdom. Shockingly, three years later, on July 31st, 1986, another 15-year-old named Don Ashworth met a similar fate and was found dead at 10 Pound Lane in Enderby, Leicestershire. Two girls, two tragic deaths, and a mystery that would unravel with countless twists and turns. Who could be behind these horrifying acts? What secrets would be unveiled in Leicestershire's darkest chapter? Leicestershire is a county located in the East Midlands region of England. It has an estimated population of around 1 million people. It's known for its rich history, diverse cultural heritage, and beautiful countryside. The county is home to the city of Leicester, famous for its historical landmarks. Leicestershire offers a blend of rural landscapes, vibrant cities, and a range of attractions, making it a captivating destination for visitors. Here, the crime rate is equivalent to 867 per thousand residents, putting it in the top 10 across the whole of England and Wales. It's here where our story begins. Linda Mann was born on July 30th, 1968 in Narborough, Leicestershire. She attended Lutterworth Grammar School, growing up alongside her older sister, Susan Mann. Their mother, Kathleen Mann's first marriage ended in 1978, but not much is known about that period. Kathleen married Edward Eastwood in 1980 when Linda was 12 years old. Linda was a typical teenager, loved by her peers, and enjoyed all the things that came with growing up, music, hairstyles, makeup, and fashion. If she needed some extra money for clothes, she'd even babysit and make her own dresses. She had no idea that her happiness and extracurricular activities were about to come to an abrupt end. On the fateful afternoon of November 21st, 1983, 15-year-old Linda told her parents that she was going to babysit at a friend's house. She said her goodbyes and left with a promise to return home by 10 p.m. But as the clock struck midnight, there was still no sign of Linda. Her worried parents grew more anxious with every passing moment. They reached out to her friends, hoping to find out where she might be, but none of them had seen her. Determined to bring their daughter back safely, they embarked on a tireless search, scouring every street and every possible place she could have gone. However, their efforts yielded no results as there were no clues about her whereabouts. It was unusual because she was always very good, always on time, or she would let us know if she was going to be late. With their hearts heavy and no answers in sight, they made the difficult decision to contact the police and officially report Linda as missing. On the following day, November 22, 1983, as the sun began to rise, a hospital porter on his way to work made a startling discovery at 7.20 a.m. at a deserted footpath known locally as the Black Pad. He stumbled upon what he initially thought was a mannequin, but upon closer inspection, it turned out to be the lifeless body of a girl. Without wasting a moment, he alerted the police, who swiftly arrived at the scene. To their dismay, they recognized the victim as Linda Mann, the young girl reported missing just the night before. Well, we'd been up all night... Um, I was looking out the window watching the children going to school, just thinking she might come back, probably, you know, ready to go to school. She'd stayed at a friend's somewhere that we didn't know of. And um, police come to the door and asked us to sit down and just said, she's dead. We found her. Small communities, all leading a very, very normal life, law-abiding, good community people, and then suddenly this happens, this disaster in, within their midst happens. It was a lovely atmosphere, very village, very community, 
Um, everyone helped each other. If you needed a hand, you knew who to go to. This lane is uh, known locally as the Black Pad. It's used mainly by uh, people walking their dogs, pedestrians from Enderby and from Narborough. At that time of night, he was taking a chance because usually this lane is fairly well used by people. He knew that it was getting dark. Um, she was alone. And the opportunity for him was there. And that's why he took it. Determined to uncover the truth, authorities promptly sent the body for a thorough autopsy, hoping to find clues that would lead them to Linda's killer. Investigators searched the immediate area around the crime scene, but despite their best efforts, they were unable to uncover any useful leads or evidence. Curiously, just a short distance away from where Linda's body was found stood a local psychiatric hospital. Initially, police considered the possibility that the perpetrator might have been a patient who had escaped during the night and committed the heinous act. The thing that I was very anxious to establish was that it was unlikely to have been a psychiatric patient from the hospital. It was much more likely to be a man leading a normal life, perhaps with a, a family, uh, certainly one who had friends, relatives and contacts who thought of him as a normal individual. However, upon thorough examination, it was revealed that the hospital had tight security measures in place and no patient had left during the previous night. This theory was ultimately ruled out due to a lack of supporting evidence. The news of the crime spread like wildfire through the peaceful town of Narborough, leaving its residents horrified. In an effort to enhance safety, young girls were strongly advised to walk in groups as a precautionary measure. I think young ladies should be very scared because we haven't found him, so we don't really know what's happening at all. It was a topic of discussion in every pub, on every bus, in every street, not just in the village of uh, Narborough or Littlethorpe or any of the areas around there, but across the whole of the county. As the investigation continued, the results of Linda's autopsy revealed some facts. It was the presence of male DNA on her body. However, back then, DNA technology was not as advanced as it is today, so they could only gather limited information. The DNA belonged to an individual with type A blood and with a PTM1 plus enzyme profile, which meant that approximately 10% of adult males in England could be the potential suspects. With such a large pool of potential culprits, every person became a suspect in the case. Meanwhile, a dedicated team of investigators went from door to door, seeking any valuable information from the residents who might have witnessed something on the night of the murder. Simultaneously, another group of investigators compiled a list of offenders involved in similar crimes in Leicestershire and proceeded to question each one of them. Just when investigators were grasping at straws trying to find any lead they could find, a mysterious phone call sparked new hope. The caller reported seeing a man with spiky hair near the location where Linda's body was discovered around 8 p.m. Unfortunately, the caller didn't provide any further details, leaving the investigators eager to gather more information. Determined to uncover leads, they revisited the crime scene and interviewed every resident in the vicinity, hoping to gather any sightings or clues about the person with spiky hair. Despite their best efforts, the investigators were unable to track down and identify the mysterious man with spiky hair. Linda Mann was buried in a churchyard close to where she was killed. During her funeral, the police took extra precautions and set up surveillance, recording the crowd to watch for anything or anyone suspicious. This was done because sometimes criminals return to the scene of the crime or engage in activities connected to the crime. The police wanted to ensure the safety of the mourners and gather any potential leads in the investigation. The police tried their best to gather information by issuing new posters of Linda Mann and hoping to jog people's memories, but unfortunately, it didn't provide much help. The investigation continued for months and even years, but there were no eyewitnesses, only a few promising leads, and many false trails that led nowhere. The murder investigation seemed to have reached a dead end, and with no significant breakthroughs, the case went cold. Well, really in any police investigation, after a week or two, uh, the trail is usually cold. It's quite difficult. We suffer all the time. Yes, please come forward. It's always frustrating when, uh, you know, you've not got an answer to a problem. And, I mean, you're forever looking over your shoulder, A, to see what you've missed, and then trying to guess what might happen in the future. Three years had gone by, and Leicestershire was slowly recovering from the shock of Linda Mann's murder. However, just when the county thought they could finally breathe at ease, 
another heart-wrenching tragedy unfolded. In the peaceful town of Enderby, Leicestershire, resided a young girl named Dawn Ashworth. At the age of 15, she shared a home with her parents, Barbara and Robin Ashworth, along with her younger brother, Andrew Ashworth. Dawn possessed a remarkable talent for drawing, showcasing her creativity and artistic skills to those around her. She had the opportunity, being in the newsagents, to buy every new magazine that was available. And um, this really was what her money went on, clothes and her look. And she was changing and blossoming, really, from day to day. It was July 31st, 1986, and Dawn left the house to visit her friend Sharon's house at 4.15 p.m. with a promise to return by 7 p.m. She strolled along Ten Pound Lane, a well-maintained and illuminated road that led to Narborough. As she continued on, the path approached the M1 highway, where it became narrower and eventually transformed into a trail. At this critical juncture, Dawn faced a decision. She could either turn left, crossing the motorway using the footbridge, and proceed along the radiator walks towards a dual carriageway, or she could continue straight ahead along the track. During late July, the lane would have been abundantly covered with tall summer plants and foliage, making it difficult to navigate. At 4.40 p.m., Dawn Ashworth walked past Edward Avenue, which marked the end of the 10-pound lane, and led to her friend Sharon's house. After reaching there, Dawn couldn't find Sharon, and she even asked her neighbors if Sharon was around, but she was nowhere to be found. After being unable to find Sharon, Dawn decided to take the shortcut back home through the densely overgrown footpath of the 10-pound lane. Dawn was expected to be back by 9.30 p.m., but when there was no sign of her, her parents grew worried. They drove around Narborough, hoping to spot their daughter along the way, but unfortunately, they couldn't find her. At 9.40 p.m., they made the decision to call the police and reported Dawn as missing. Interestingly, the same officers who had been investigating Linda Mann's case were assigned to Dawn's case as well. Here was a girl of the same age as Linda Mann, a girl on her own, going from A to B, and disappears. So consequently, we, um, we did treat it uh, with uh, a great deal of priority. The police made a plea to the public, urging anyone with information about Don Ashworth, or who may have witnessed anything unusual on July 31st, 1986, to come forward. They even spoke with Sharon to see if she had encountered Don that day, but she had no knowledge or information to provide. The search for Don continued, and after two days, on August 2nd, 1986, the police made a grim discovery. They found Dawn's lifeless body hidden under thick brush near Ten Pound Lane. We've got to find the fiend, really, that did this to my daughter, to our daughter, and um, stop it from happening again. Surprisingly, her body was found less than a mile away from where Linda Mann's body had been found three years earlier. The investigators found male DNA on Dawn's body, and it matched the blood type of the person who had killed Linda Mann. This led them to believe that the culprit could be the same for both cases. The similarities between the murders and the matching blood type connected the two cases and pointed to a single perpetrator. There were signature elements in the crime, certainly. Uh, both murders took place on footpaths. Both girls were uh, teenagers. Um, both girls were walking alone. Police launched an extensive investigation into the murder of Dawn. At the end of Ten Pound Lane, the police set up a mobile incident room where they gathered information from villagers and passers-by. They received about 200 phone calls and had numerous visitors to the mobile unit. One particular lead seemed promising and focused on a motorcycle that was seen parked under the motorway bridge. Several reports mentioned a young man wearing a red crash helmet in that area around 5 p.m. on the day of the crime. Now, it struck the police that on August 1, 1986, a day after Dawn was reported missing, but before her body was found, a policeman and a detective had noticed a young man riding a red motorcycle and wearing a red crash helmet. They observed this individual showing interest in the search. What are you doing? You're looking for a girl. Buckland was going around telling people that the police were looking in the wrong area. He even told police officers looking for Dawn that they were looking in the wrong place. Take your helmet off. Buckland was a local lad who worked in the so hospital nice, in Andrew. Richard, Richard, what? Just stay there, Richard. There was something not right. The person was a 17-year-old kitchen porter, Richard Buckland, who worked at Carlton Haynes Hospital, a psychiatric hospital near the locations where Linda and Dawn's bodies were discovered. When questioned by the police, he 
He claimed to have seen Dawn walking in the lane on the day she went missing, but had no information where she could be. Although the police didn't pay much attention to his statement at the time, they decided to speak to him again later to gather more information. The day after Dawn's body was found, Richard visited his friend's house at 10 p.m. He couldn't contain his excitement and shared the news that Dawn's body had been discovered near a gate by the M1 bridge, hidden in a hedge. The friend's father overheard their conversation and was curious to know how the porter had learned such specific information that hadn't been made public. When asked, Richard mysteriously replied that someone had told him. He went on to describe that Dawn's body had been hanging from a tree and was then concealed under tree branches and debris. She was found inside an access gate leading from 10 Pound Lane into a field, only a 10-minute walk from the M1 bridge. The friend's father found it suspicious, but at the time, he dismissed the conversation, thinking that Richard may have spoken to someone connected to the police who had informed him about the discovery. However, days later, when he heard reports about people seeing a person on a motorcycle near 10 Pound Lane where Don's body was found, his suspicions grew. He remembered that Richard also owned a motorcycle and had provided unusual information that night. On August 8, 1986, he informed the police about his suspicions. After gathering all the information, the police became convinced that Richard was the person seen riding the motorcycle on the day of the murder. They wasted no time and decided to arrest him. We uh, weren't satisfied with his explanations and a decision was taken to arrest him. There was a sense of, thank God, you know, the man has been caught after all this time and this will hopefully put an end to it. Richard was taken to a Wigston police station for more questioning. He gave different and conflicting statements to the investigators, but he didn't admit to seeing Dawn on the day she went missing and speaking to her. At one moment, he confessed to everything, but soon after, he took back his confession. After enduring a challenging 15-hour interrogation, Richard eventually confessed to killing Dawn during his third interview. The police were relieved to have found the person responsible, especially considering the similarities between the two murders. They strongly believed that Richard was also involved in the murder of Linda Mann three years earlier. Even though Richard admitted to killing Dawn, he stubbornly maintained his innocence in the murder of Linda. The police were skeptical of his claims and were determined to uncover the truth. They sought assistance from Dr. Alec Jeffrey, a geneticist at the University of Leicester, located just a short distance from where both girls were tragically killed. Dr. Jeffrey had been studying inherited illnesses when he stumbled upon a groundbreaking technique known as DNA or genetic profiling. This discovery would prove to be a pivotal turning point in the investigation. David Baker said, well, look, let's cement the case against this young man. Let's go to this geneticist at Leicester University, this Dr. Alec Jeffries, and take the semen samples from both murders and cement our case with this new thing called genetic fingerprinting, whatever it is, and let's just prove that he did both of them because we know he must have done both of them. It would be the first time in a criminal case investigators used the new technique called DNA profiling to try and find out who committed the double murder. They wanted to know if Richard was truly responsible for both killings. My initial reaction was, well, yes, we will try, but don't hold out too much hope. Nobody's ever attempted this sort of analysis on relatively old, real forensic casework. Dr. Jeffrey tested the DNA of the victims, Linda and Don Ashworth, and discovered that they were both indeed attacked by the same man. Then he conducted a test on the type A DNA, which was recovered from both victims' bodies to Richard's DNA. That's where the surprising twist emerged that no one expected. The DNA didn't match Richard's DNA. What about the prime suspect, Richard Buckland? This is his blood DNA profile here and here, completely different from the semen profile. Conclusion, both girls have been raped and therefore presumably murdered by the same man, and that man was not the prime suspect, Richard Buckland. Which meant he was not the one who killed Dawn, and he also didn't kill Linda. It was, it was a blow to us. They didn't, basically didn't believe a word that we were saying, and that was quite right healthy skepticism of, of an entirely new technology. And indeed, I didn't believe the results myself, so we did retesting. The testing was done, again, independently by home office forensic scientists, all pointing to the same conclusion, namely that Buckland was not the guilty party in this case. The police were shocked by the results because they were sure Richard was the killer. But now, they were back to the beginning with no leads. After spending four months in custody, 
Richard Buckland was released and made history as the first person in the world to be proven innocent of murder through DNA profiling. However, a puzzling question remained. Why did Richard confess to a crime he didn't commit? According to Richard, he felt immense pressure to catch the real killer quickly because the murders were terrifying the community. Then the pressure started getting really hard. You just didn't have a chance. So he falsely confessed to the crime, hoping it would bring back a sense of normalcy to the people. However, after DNA evidence proved his innocence, Richard was no longer considered a suspect. The investigation into the double murder continued as the authorities now had to find the true culprit. Meanwhile, Don Ashworth's funeral took place at Enderby Parish Church in Leicestershire on Thursday, August 28, 1986. Many people from the community attended to show their respects and remember the moments they shared with Don. Inspector Derek Pierce was appointed to lead the investigation in 1987. He diligently went through 1,800 messages sent by the public, searching for any valuable leads. One particular message caught his attention. It mentioned an individual without an alibi who had a history of indecent exposure. The message urged the police to investigate a man in Littlethorpe. Since there were numerous individuals without alibis in the area, the investigators decided to explore a new approach. They pondered the potential of DNA evidence and whether they could match the individual's blood type to the evidence found at the crime scene. The first ever DNA manhunt began in January 1987, and the police took a unique approach. They sent letters to all men between the ages of 13 and 33 residing in the villages of Narborough and Enderby. The letters requested their voluntary participation in a blood and saliva test. The purpose of the DNA testing was to identify those individuals who shared the same blood type as the killer, which accounted for approximately 10% of the population. The goal was to narrow down the suspects and apprehend the guilty party. Surprisingly, thousands of men from the villages willingly provided blood samples, all in an effort to capture the person responsible for the murders of the two schoolgirls in Leicestershire. Not at all, no. I think the uh, person responsible might have. After conducting the tests, only a quarter of the thousands of men were cleared of suspicion. The forensic laboratory was overwhelmed with the large number of samples, and it became evident that the testing process would take longer than the initial estimated time frame of two months. By May 1987, a total of 3,653 men had undergone the tests, but due to the heavy workload faced by the laboratory technicians, only 2,000 individuals had been eliminated from the investigation. It was a slow process. I mean, we'd started in the January, and of course we're now into July, August. And, and I mean, we're still taking samples, and we're still having uh, samples processed. So, I mean, you know, we didn't know whether there was one in the system from the samples that we'd already taken. On September 18th, 1987, the police received a phone call that would change everything. As it turned the whole investigation upside down, challenging the investigators for the further twist. It was a woman who had crucial information to share, information that could unravel the mysteries and reveal the truth behind the murders. I was in the um, murder incident room when the call came through. It was a breakthrough, if you like, that we in fact were waiting for. It was good information. Nobody could make that kind of information up. We knew when that information came that uh, if that was the case, there was um, something not uh, not quite right. She shared that she and her co-workers had gathered at a local pub during their day off and Ian Kelly, a fellow bakery worker, had joined them. As they discussed the ongoing DNA manhunt, she overheard Kelly bragging about taking the blood test meant for Colin Pitchfork. This raised suspicions in her mind because it seemed unusual for someone to willingly take another person's test regardless of their fear of the police. Recognizing the significance of this revelation, she decided to contact the Leicestershire Murder Inquiry team leading them to focus their attention on Colin Pitchfork. The police wasted no time and quickly located Colin to question him about the blood test and his knowledge of the two murders. As it turned out, Colin became the last person to take a blood test in the murder investigation. The DNA analysis confirmed what everyone expected. Colin was a perfect match. And then they took the pattern on film from Pitchfork, compared it with semen recovered from the victims, and showed that, the, that these complex patterns matched up. Colin faced intense interrogation, realizing he'd been caught with no way to escape. Within a short time, he confessed to the killings of both Linda Mann and Don Ashworth. He admitted that he already had a criminal record and was known to the police for previous convictions, including indecent exposure. He'd been desperate to avoid further involvement with the police, 
so he convinced his co-worker Ian Kelly to take the blood test on his behalf. Since Kelly lived outside the area and wasn't asked to take the test himself, he seemed like the perfect cover for Colin. Pitchfork spun him a yarn that um, he'd already given blood on behalf of somebody else who uh, couldn't go because he was wanted by the police, etc., etc. And uh, Kelly ostensibly swallowed that hook, line and sinker. So when Ian Kelly took the blood test on behalf of Colin, among the more than 5,000 men who voluntarily provided blood and saliva samples, it didn't match with Colin's DNA at the crime scene. This allowed Colin to avoid suspicion and escape being caught at that time. Colin Pitchfork was born on March 23, 1960, in Newbold, Verdon, and attended school in Market Bosworth and Desford. He was 21 years old when he got married to Carol Pitchfork, a social worker in 1981. They had two children together. Unfortunately, Carol had no knowledge that she was married to a serial killer. I think he was able to deceive her perfectly well so that nobody in the whole world knew that he was the guilty person. It's the same story. Uh, the wife, the brother, the mother, the friends of serial killers never suspect that they could be serial killers. Before getting married, Colin Pitchfork had committed indecent exposure and had to undergo therapy at Carlton Hayes Hospital in Narborough. He'd been working as an apprentice at Hampshire's Bakery in Leicester since 1976 until his arrest for the murders. In 1979, Colin forcibly assaulted a girl in a field. Then in October 1985, he assaulted another girl, threatening her with a screwdriver and holding a knife to her throat. Now, it was time for justice to be served for all his crimes. On January 22, 1988, Colin Pitchfork faced trial at the Crown Court in Leicester. During the trial, Ian Kelly was found guilty of conspiracy to obstruct justice. He received a sentence of 18 months in prison, but it was suspended, meaning he didn't serve any time behind bars. I was wrong for doing what I did. Colin admitted his guilt for the two murders, as well as the assault of two other girls and conspiring to obstruct justice. He was the first person to receive a life sentence using DNA profiling as evidence. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murders and 10 years for the assaults. Additionally, he received three years for each count of assault and three years for perverting the course of justice, with all sentences to be served at the same time. A psychiatric report described Colin as having a psychopathic personality disorder. The Lord Chief Justice stated that for the safety of the public, there were doubts about whether he would ever be released. The Secretary of State said a minimum term of 30 years, which was later reduced to 28 years on appeal in 2009. On June 7, 2021, Colin was granted conditional release from prison. However, the Secretary of State for Justice, Robert Buckland, requested a review of the decision and Colin remained in custody while the review was conducted. On July 13, 2021, it was reported that the review had been denied, meaning Colin would be released. He was ultimately released on September 1, 2021. In November 2021, Colin was sent back to prison for violating the conditions of his release by approaching young women while on walks from his bail hostel. It's important to note that he didn't commit any new crimes during this time. In June 2023, it was announced that Colin would be released on parole once again. This decision received significant criticism from the public. Barbara Ashworth, the mother of Don Ashworth, expressed her strong disapproval of Colin Pitchfork's release. She said, It was known that he'd be released, but I believe he shouldn't be allowed to breathe the same air as us. She firmly believed that Colin, who admitted to the murders of both girls, deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison because of the heinous crimes he committed. She added, he did much more than just the murders. Her words highlight the deep pain and anger felt by the victims' families and the belief that Colin should have received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. I think we've learnt a lot from the deaths of both of these two girls. Certainly the scientific advances that um, have been made with um, DNA has uh, spread itself now throughout uh, the world. It was this case of all cases where, on which DNA really cut its teeth in the forensic sense. The door has been opened to a whole new aspect of uh, medical investigation. People will be talking about this case a hundred years from now, not because of my book, but because of Alec Jeffrey's discovery. What are your thoughts on this case? Does Colin Pitchfork deserve to be paroled? Whatever happened to Tamika happened right there in your apartment. Yeah, I believe that. How you know your blood? It could be in my blood. No, it can't be anybody's blood. How long do you think we've been doing this? 
You don't know that we can tell one person's blood from another blood? Bad. On Monday, June 14, 2004, the family of 24-year-old Tamika Houston reported her missing after weeks of no contact. Although she was known to be independent, spontaneous, and often went days without contacting her family, it was unusual for her to go completely silent without returning any calls. The family contacted the Spartanburg Police Department in South Carolina to do a welfare check on Tamika. After searching the house, they noticed that many things didn't align with what they were told about Tamika's personality. This raised questions for investigating officers who launched an immediate search for the young woman. Had Tamika decided to leave her life behind in search of her dreams? Or was there a more sinister aspect to her disappearance? Today, we visit Spartanburg, South Carolina, the county seat of Spartanburg County. In the late 19th century, it was the center of the textile manufacturing industry. Its nickname, Hub City, comes from the railroad lines that radiated from the city center to form the shape of a wheel hubcap. Spartanburg's population of 38,000 enjoys a suburban lifestyle with the charm of southern small-town living. In terms of affordability, it's a good area to raise a family. But like other cities of its size, crime is always present. It does lean towards having a high crime rate, but following the general safety rules can reduce one's chances of becoming a victim. It's in Spartanburg that our story begins. Tamika Antoinette Houston was born in Spartanburg, South Carolina on December 11, 1979, to parents Anthony Houston and Gabriella Semeneni. She had an older stepbrother named Shaquan, a younger brother named Anthony Jr., and a sister named Antonia. Tamika was described as having a warm and welcoming personality. She was always smiling and made friends easily. After graduating high school, Tamika began working as a waitress. She moved out of her family home and settled into her own small house on Harvard Drive in Spartanburg. Tamika always had a love for animals, and once she found herself her own place, she adopted a pit bull named Macy. Tamika was also very involved in her church, particularly the church choir. She loved to sing and intended on pursuing a career in the music industry. In 2003, she auditioned for the popular reality show American Idol in Atlanta, Georgia, but didn't get through the first round. After realizing that her dream of performing was going to be a long and arduous journey, she decided to return to nursing school and settled into her new passion. In May 2004, the school term was at an end and the summer holidays were fast approaching. Tamika was preparing for a much-needed break from nursing school and the exams. She was known to make sudden decisions to visit friends and family. She didn't have class to report to. She didn't have a job to, to go to every morning. She was very spontaneous. She was the type of person to get in her car and kind of go. Initially, her family wasn't concerned by her lack of communication. However, her aunt, Rebecca Howard, grew concerned when she discovered Tamika hadn't been returning her mother's calls. Two weeks was too long to go without contact. Rebecca contacted the Spartanburg Police Department, believing something may have happened to Tamika. I called police and said that there's clearly something wrong. I can't locate my niece. She's not returning anyone's phone calls. Officers from the department agreed to do a welfare check, but told Rebecca it was possible she may have just decided to take a trip out of town. When they arrived at Tamika's house, they first noticed that her car, a 1991 black Honda CRX, was missing and the doors to her house were all locked. They walked around the house and found one of the windows unlocked. Officers announced their presence, but received no response. Fearing something may have happened to her, they entered through the window. Inside, however, officers found some clues that didn't quite add up. They noticed an uncashed paycheck on the kitchen counter. A check of the house revealed that there were no evident signs of a struggle. While looking through the rooms, officers started to smell something awful in the air. It was not a good sign and officers intensified their search. What they discovered was a disturbing sight. In one of the rooms was Tamika's beloved pet dog, Macy, and a litter of puppies. What was disturbing was that Macy and her puppies were left to fend for themselves. Macy and her puppies were severely malnourished and the room was in a deplorable state. When officers reported their findings to Tamika's family, they knew that something bad must have happened to her. She was not the type of person to neglect Macy. Police immediately issued an all-points bulletin and a bolo, or be on the lookout, to locate Tamika and her car while her family in Spartanburg began distributing flyers with her details around town. Tamika's family also contacted the local media in an attempt to gain more focus on her case. As a mother, it's very difficult not knowing where my daughter is or hoping that 
and thank him that she's okay and safe. Detectives Steve Lamb and Jay Stedman were tasked with leading the investigation into Tamika's disappearance. They began the groundwork immediately and subpoenaed Tamika's banking and cell phone records in order to trace her movements. What they discovered was that Tamika had not made use of either her cell phone service or bank account since early May 2004. The records backed up the family's statements. No one had heard from Tamika since early May. The investigation was beginning to look suspiciously like a case of a runaway adult but the family provided detectives with an interesting clue. While interviewing family members, investigators Lamb and Stedman were told by many of them to look into Terence Moss, Tamika's ex-boyfriend. Several family members mentioned to the detectives that Tamika and Terence had recently gone through a turbulent breakup. Armed with the name, they ran a background check on Terence and discovered he had a criminal record. There was an incident at her house where she accused him of hitting her and striking her. However many flares can go off in a law enforcement officer's mind, that's how many would have gone off with Terrence Walls. A further check revealed an interesting twist in the investigation. Terrence was scheduled to appear in court for domestic violence charge a week after Tamika was reported missing. The charge, ironically, was laid by Tamika, who had conveniently vanished before the hearing. This provided detectives with a possible motive. They had two possibilities. Firstly, Tamika could have fled the city to avoid appearing in court and testifying against Terence. The second possibility, however, was more sinister. Terence could have abducted Tamika and may have been holding her hostage in order to have the charges against him dropped for her lack of appearance in court. They couldn't rule out either possibility, so their next step was to call in Terence. On June 23, 2004, Terence voluntarily went to the Spartanburg police station after detectives called him in for an interview. He told detectives he was there to help them in any way possible in order to find Tamika. Detectives, however, were more interested in his relationship with Tamika. Terence explained that he and Tamika met in the year 2000 and were living together until March 2004. Detectives then told Terence that they were aware of what happened between the couple. He confessed to hitting Tamika after they had an argument over his alleged affairs. Tamika then told him to move out and filed a domestic abuse charge against him. I actually punched her. Um... And I fell down on my knees and I started praying. And I was like, it's just so many demons in here that, you know, we, we're becoming physical with each other now that we just need to separate. When detectives presented their theories to what they believe may have happened to Tamika, Terrence denied any involvement in her disappearance. He told officers that he regretted his actions during their argument and was genuinely concerned for her safety after he heard she was missing. Terrence became a person of interest after his interview with detectives, but without any physical evidence to link him to Tamika's disappearance, he was released. Investigators, however, were not slowing down in their search for Tamika. They started by looking at recent hospital admissions and threw files at local mortuaries for any Jane Doe's who may have been reported between May and June 2004. They had also looked through the accident reports and 911 calls that were made between that same time period. It was then that they came across a rather distressing piece of information. Someone had called to report the murder of a woman and explained that her body was dumped in the Cleveland Park Lake, not very far from Tamika's house. The call was made in June, around the same time she was reported missing. Investigators launched an immediate search of the area. Divers were sent into the lake and searched it thoroughly. Investigators on the ground also looked for a body among the hedges and trees using cadaver dogs. Hours later, the search was called off after investigators concluded that there was no body to be found. To detectives, it sounded like a call made to detract their investigation. They tried to trace the call back to a location, but discovered it was made from a prepaid cell phone or burner phone near Cleveland Park Lake. In a way, it provided hope for detectives because they believed Tamika may still be alive and could be rescued. Meanwhile, Tamika's family continued to keep the public informed about Tamika and her disappearance. They offered a reward of $50,000 to anyone who could provide information that would lead to Tamika's discovery. Detectives received numerous tips, many of which were bogus. The leads that seemed promising ended up being cases of mistaken identity, leading investigators to dead ends. However, Tamika's family were not ready to throw in the towel, and their persistence would lead investigators to another promising lead. In July 2004, a month after Tamika was reported missing, a woman called the Spartanburg Police Department to report an abandoned car in her Barksdale apartment parking lot. A woman saw the flyer and saw the description picture of the car on there and said, you know, this looks like a car that's parked behind Barksdale Apartments. It wasn't just any car. 
The woman said it looked similar to the car and the missing person's posters all over the city. Investigators and forensic units rushed to the Barksdale apartment complex that was located just four miles away from where Tamika lived. The car looked exactly like the one Tamika owned, and after checking the number plates against their records, investigators confirmed that it was, in fact, her car. What investigators still needed to determine was whether Tamika abandoned the car herself or if someone else had parked it in the apartment complex. Forensic teams searched through the car looking for any clues. There was no blood or scuff marks to suggest a struggle had occurred. However, after dusting down every surface, they found a partial fingerprint on the steering wheel. Under the front passenger seat, investigators discovered a set of keys. After weeks of searching for Tamika, they finally located a piece of evidence that could possibly unlock more answers in their investigation. Investigators questioned residents at Barksdale about whether they'd seen anyone parking the car in the apartment parking lot. One resident said he'd seen a single African-American man park the car and walk away. Another said he saw two African-American men abandoning the car. The reports were conflicting. Investigators had to rely on the evidence they found to point them in some direction, the partial fingerprint and the set of unknown keys. The fingerprint was uploaded to the Integrated Automated Fingerprint Identification System, but there was no match in the system. This allowed investigators to eliminate Terrence as a suspect. The only other clue investigators had was the set of keys. Detective Jay Stedman began the process of elimination by using the keys to unlock Tamika's car, but none of them worked. He then visited her house and tried using the keys to unlock the doors of the house. That too turned out to be a dead end. Investigators reasoned that if the keys did not belong to Tamika, then they must have belonged to the person responsible for her disappearance. A further look at the keys revealed a stamp with the code AA14 on the surface. These keys were then taken to all local locksmiths for identification. Fortunately, one of the locksmiths identified the key immediately. He told detectives that the keys were made for the Fremont School apartment complex in Spartanburg. Investigators learned the apartment complex was once an elementary school that had been converted into public housing. There were 46 apartments in total, and investigators tried the keys out on every door. When they believed their luck had finally run out, the key unlocked a basement apartment which had been abandoned due to flooding. Nevertheless, investigators collected whatever evidence they could and sent this to the crime lab for testing. They also questioned the apartment complex maintenance man who told them the basement apartment had been empty for a long time. He then explained the policy of the apartment's management team. The doorknobs on each apartment were switched around after a tenant was evicted. This avoided non-paying tenants from using their keys to re-enter the flat without the manager's knowledge. However, the apartment's records were not kept in good order, so he was unable to tell investigators from which apartment the doorknob had been exchanged. He was, however, able to provide investigators with a list of former tenants. The results from the crime lab were disappointment. They didn't provide any evidence that proved Tamika had been in the apartment. Investigators then turned to the list of names of former tenants. Tamika's family didn't recognize any of the names on the list, but a close friend of hers said one of the names sounded familiar. Her best friend mentioned there's this guy named Chris that she started seeing around the time of her disappearance. For Tamika's family, the news was unexpected. Tamika's friend told investigators that Tamika mentioned a man named Chris with whom she'd recently started dating after her split from Terrence. She wasn't sure about his last name, but there was a tenant on the list named Christopher Hampton. Investigators ran a background check on Christopher. The results raised many eyebrows. 23-year-old Christopher had a criminal history. He was convicted on a charge of bank robbery in May 2000 and had served four years for the crime. He was in the middle of serving a 30-day sentence after being arrested for a traffic violation. Because he'd broken the conditions of his parole, Christopher was sent to jail without a hearing. However, at the time of Tamika's disappearance, he was not in jail and had also been evicted from his flat at the Fremont School apartment a month after she was reported missing. After locating him, investigators brought Christopher in for questioning in late June 2004. He admitted that he was dating Tamika, but said he wasn't responsible for her disappearance. When they asked Christopher where he thought Tamika was, he responded by saying she'd mentioned something about going to Bike Week. She said, I want to go to Bike Week. She said who she was going with? No, she didn't say. She said she was going. Did you see her at any point after that? No, last time I seen her. His fingerprints were checked against the partial print found in Tamika's car. Investigators were certain that Christopher's fingerprints would match. However, their hopes at finding a lead hit an unexpected dead end. The fingerprints were not a match. Investigators were at a loss. 
Every lead they had was drying up. With no physical evidence to link him to Tamika's disappearance, police allowed him to return to jail. He was released after serving his time in mid-July 2004. It had been almost three months since Tamika's disappearance when investigators received yet another promising lead. It was an unexpected twist in the case. Within days of Christopher being questioned, a woman contacted investigators about Tamika's case. The woman who called identified herself as the ex-wife of Christopher Hampton. She told investigators that she knew Christopher was dating Tamika at the time of her disappearance and she was following the case in the local media. The woman told investigators she might have some evidence they would be interested in. She revealed that she was in possession of Christopher's wallet. She explained that he'd mailed her his wallet for safekeeping while he served out his sentence. Inside the wallet, she found a red spot on one of the pictures he kept of her and their two children. She agreed to hand over the wallet to investigators if they were willing to fetch it from her. The detectives jumped at the opportunity and paid Christopher's ex-wife a visit. After retrieving the wallet, they sent the photo to be tested for traces of human blood. The red spot was confirmed to be human blood. Investigators then contacted Tamika's parents, Anthony and Gabriella, and asked them to submit DNA samples to test against the blood sample. After a month of waiting, the results were ready. It turned out that the blood on the photo belonged to Tamika. Once again, investigators tracked down Christopher and brought him in for questioning. He denied having done anything to Tamika and argued that the blood could belong to anyone. Investigators told them that DNA evidence didn't lie, but Christopher remained adamant about his innocence. Whatever happened to Tamika happened right there in your apartment. Yeah, I believe that. How you know that blood? It could be in my blood. No, it can't be anybody's blood. How long do you think we've been doing this? You don't know that we can tell one person's blood from another blood? Uh, you ever heard of DNA? Yeah. Investigators knew that Christopher was responsible for harming Tamika, as the blood evidence proved that he was near enough to cause her some physical harm. However, they understood that the evidence was circumstantial at best. Without a body, the evidence they had may not be able to stand up in court or in front of a jury. There was no way to prove if Christopher had murdered Tamika or if she'd simply been injured and escaped without informing anyone. Had Christopher been responsible for Tamika's death without a body in an autopsy, there was no way to prove if it was murder, manslaughter, accidental, or self-defense. Investigators' hands were tied. As time dragged on, Tamika's case remained open, but leads were far in view. Toward the end of 2004, though, another surprising lead presented itself. This was the lead that was going to blow the case wide open. The young woman made contact with detectives from the Spartanburg Police Department. She claimed to have been dating Christopher during May 2004. According to the young woman, she'd been inside Christopher's apartment, apartment 215, around the time Tamika disappeared and made note of several odd things. There was a large reddish-brown stain on the bedroom floor and his dresser had been pushed up against the closet door. She told investigators she didn't want to alert Christopher to what she'd noticed. Instead, she spent the night with them in his apartment. When investigators questioned her further, they discovered she was only 15 years old at the time of Tamika's disappearance. She was also afraid of Christopher's retaliation if he discovered she was the one who snitched on him. This information was kept quiet by the investigative team as they worked to secure a warrant to search apartment 215 based on the new lead. Investigators remained cautiously optimistic as they knew it had been too long since Tamika disappeared and whatever physical evidence remained could have been contaminated by the new tenants living in the apartment. In July 2005, 14 months after Tamika disappeared, investigators obtained the search warrant for Christopher's former apartment. Forensic specialists joined investigators as they prepared to enter the apartment. The information provided by the young woman was accurate. It was obvious someone had tried to clean up something in the bedroom. On the carpeted floor was a large patch that had been bleached clean. When forensic investigators cut out the top layer of carpet, they found a large amount of dried blood. Investigators then sprayed luminol around the bedroom and the scene lit up in front of them when they switched the lights off. In the closet, investigators discovered huge patches of blood. DNA testing was sped up as investigators already had Tamika's parents' DNA in storage. The results came back as belonging to Tamika. It was a heartbreaking moment for investigators as they broke the news to Tamika's devastated family. They surmised that Tamika may have been locked in the cupboard and bled to death while Christopher entertained an underage girl in the apartment that night. From the amount of blood evidence left behind, investigators were sure that Tamika was dead. It just took all the life out of me because I knew that uh, 
Hey, my daughter was in an apartment and there was enough blood that my daughter could have died. What they needed to do now was find her body and give her family the peace they deserved. On Friday, August 12, 2005, Christopher was arrested for the murder of Tamika Houston and taken in for questioning at the Spartanburg police station. Christopher remained silent as investigators presented the evidence they found. Knowing the evidence they had against him was irrefutable, Christopher stood up and told investigators he was ready to go. He then told them he was going to show them where he buried Tamika. He stands up and he says, let's go. We said, where are we going? Are we going to the jail? Are we going, are you going to show us where she's at? He says, I'll show you where, where she's at. That afternoon, Christopher led police to a dense wooded area about 12 miles away from the city center. He pointed out the exact spot where he buried Tamika in a shallow grave. He told investigators he was sure that this was the spot because he'd laid two branches in the shape of a cross as a marker on the grave. Forensic teams set out to dig up the graves and found the skeletal remains of a female body. The skull, however, was missing, but the lower jaw was found. The remains were taken to a crime lab and the teeth of the lower jaw were compared to Tamika's dental records. It was a match. It was really a difficult time for our entire family and to see my sister like suffer so much. You never really recover fully from, from um, losing someone in that way. Christopher was taken back to the interrogation room where he confessed to what had happened that night and how he killed Tamika. According to Christopher, Tamika had come to his apartment while he was getting ready to go out for the night. She demanded money from him, but he told her that he was trying to save money for the child he was expecting with another woman. This angered Tamika as she was still upset about his apparent infidelity. The argument between the two escalated and in a fit of anger, he hit her in the head with a hot iron. She started to bleed out in the bedroom floor and he hurriedly wrapped her body in some bed sheets before stuffing her into his closet. He then propped the dresser up against the door in case the door accidentally opened and her body rolled out. Afterwards, he went out for the night and returned home with the young woman who he knew was underage. They had dinner in the apartment and then spent the night together. The next morning, he borrowed a friend's car and drove around with Tamika's body before finding a suitable place to bury her. Afterward, he drove Tamika's car to another apartment complex and abandoned the vehicle. Unknowingly, he dropped his set of keys in the car. While in jail awaiting trial, Christopher gave reporters interviews and claimed that killing Tamika was an accident. He said that he felt deep regret every time he watched the news and saw Tamika's family reaching out to people for help in finding Tamika. He stated that a few months after he buried Tamika, he returned to the wooded area and dug up her body. He claimed that he intended to go to the police and turn himself in for committing the crime. However, he developed cold feet and changed his mind. Instead, he removed her skull and threw it in a dumpster in the city. Investigators believed his motive was to avoid police discovering both her identity and the extent of injuries he actually inflicted on Tamika. Spartanburg County Prosecutor Trey Gowdy began preparing for the murder trial against Christopher Hampton. Investigators provided physical evidence, witness statements, and an actual recorded confession making the state's case against Christopher airtight. Christopher pleaded not guilty at his arraignment and remained in the Spartanburg County Jail until his trial was set to begin in April 2006. In the final week of March 2006, jury selections took place. On Monday, April 3rd, 2006, Christopher's murder trial began. In a shocking twist, Christopher asked the judge permission to address the court. He decided to change his plea to guilty. Christopher's defense team argued for the judge to consider his admission of guilt as a sign of remorse and sentence him to a maximum term of 40 years behind bars. Tamika's family were present at the trial and the judge allowed her mother, Gabriella, to speak on their behalf before he passed the sentence. She told the court that Christopher deserved a life sentence. He'd put them through tremendous suffering for over 15 months and had taken from them the light of their lives. Christopher was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He remains behind bars at Broad River Prison in South Carolina. Recent reports from the prison show Christopher in a less than favorable light. He's known to have broken several prison rules and has had many privileges revoked as a result. Tamika's disappearance may have been a tragedy for her family and friends, but in a way, it helped highlight a social issue within the media industry itself. In 2004, when Tamika was declared missing, the media coverage in her hometown was extensive. However, her family had no success in getting her story out nationally. 
Tamika's disappearance was overshadowed by the cases of Lacey Peterson, Lori Hacking, Jennifer Wilbanks, and Natalie Holloway. I think a number of years, they, the particularly the cable uh, networks, they found a formula that worked. Mm -hmm. When they covered these cases like they were soap operas with constant updates and little twists and turns, they saw, you know, people were engaging online, people were tuning into these stories, so that worked for them, and they kept doing it. It was around 2005 that the term missing white woman syndrome was coined. It referred to the media's extensive coverage of cases involving white women over people of color. Rebecca saw the unfair news coverage and tried to change her approach. Her attempt to bring attention to cases of missing women of color had an impact. Derica, a retired police officer and his sister-in-law, Natalie Wilson, had noticed the intense fight Tamika's aunt Rebecca had put up to have her story heard. Inspired by Rebecca and Tamika's story, the Wilson sisters founded the Black and Missing Foundation in 2006. The nonprofit organization aimed to bring awareness to missing persons of color and provide the families of these people with the vital resources and tools to cope through the difficult times. The foundation also worked to educate the minority community on personal safety. To date, they've brought closure to over 300 missing persons cases and have produced a docu-series titled Black and Missing that was inspired by Tamika's case. In 2022, Tamika's story became the focus of a podcast titled Finding Tamika. The podcast is centered around Tamika's disappearance and subsequent murder. In the telling of Tamika's story, the producers included the impact Tamika's case had on the missing women's coverage conversation. It's also helped highlight the invisibility of women of color when it comes to missing persons cases. Following the death of Tamika, her family continued to suffer with her loss. Although her Aunt Rebecca used their family tragedy to help the minority community, Tamika's father Anthony never fully recovered from her death. According to Anthony's friend Mike Fowler, he was a successful man who had a smile that could light up a room. He described Anthony as being driven to find Tamika when she was reported missing. After Tamika's death, Anthony became a shell of his former self. On January 9, 2017, tragedy struck the Houston family once more. Paramedics were called to the home of Anthony Houston. Exactly who had made the call was never made public. He was found dead in the home he shared with his wife, Joanne. He'd suffered a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Joanne, too, had been shot and was still alive when emergency services arrived. However, she later died in hospital. The investigation concluded that it was an apparent murder-suicide. Friends close to the couple said there were never any visible signs as to what led to such a tragedy. The couple were the picture of love and devotion. It was clear that no one else would understand what issues they were battling in their personal lives. The impact of Tamika's death was felt in two ways within her family. Her aunt Rebecca used the tragedy to create awareness and bring about a change, while her father, Anthony, suffered in silence to the very end. It also serves as a reminder to women to be wary of the company they keep. Our case today opens many channels for debate, but here are some things for you, our viewer, to consider. Do you think Tamika's case will have the impact her Aunt Rebecca wants? Do you believe that Christopher Hampton felt any remorse for killing Tamika? Is the missing white woman syndrome trend still a cause for concern in current media trends? This is Nick. It's nice to meet you. For any parent, there is no fear worse than your child disappearing. See, ain't I beautiful? Yeah, beautiful blonde hair. I don't look like a, a little pixie. In June 1994, 13-year-old Nicholas Barkley played a game of basketball with his friends in San Antonio, Texas. After the game, Nicholas began walking home, but he never made it home. Three years later, in 1997, a different and older Nicholas was flown back from Spain after allegedly being rescued from a kidnapping ring. But things were never as they seemed. What really happened to Nicholas, and how did he end up in Spain? Today's story takes us to 1994 San Antonio. It's a city in Bexar County, Texas, USA. With 1.4 million residents in 2020, San Antonio is America's biggest Hispanic-majority city. Despite its size, San Antonio has a comparatively lower homicide rate, with 11.15 homicides per 100,000 residents in 2020, down from 18.3 the previous year 
and significantly lower than its peak of 22 in 1993. That same year, the city earned the label Drive-By City due to over 1,200 drive-by shootings recorded by the San Antonio Police Department fueled by gang violence. In 1993, San Antonio witnessed 230 homicides, its highest since 1991. Despite this, San Antonio is relatively safe and residents are generally welcoming as most crimes involve gang members or are domestic. This is the city where Nicholas Barkley lived with his family. Nicholas Patrick Barkley, known affectionately as Nicky, was born on December 31, 1980 in the vibrant city of Salt Lake City, Utah, USA. Born to a single mother, Beverly Dollarhide, Nicholas had a distinctive spirit that set him apart. Beverly had two older children from a previous marriage, a daughter, Carrie, and a son, Jason, both considerably older than Nicholas. Nicholas had light brown hair and blue eyes. Standing at four feet, eight inches tall, growing up in San Antonio, Nicholas was surrounded by a mix of urban vibrancy and natural beauty. From a young age, he showed a keen interest in exploring his surroundings and engaging in outdoor activities. However, Nicholas's life was also shaped by his surroundings. His mother's job at a local convenience store required night graveyard shifts, leaving Nicholas to face many hurdles on his own. Diagnosed with Attention Deficit Disorder, also known as ADD, early on, Nicholas's teachers recognized his potential and sought to support him. They contacted Child Protective Services out of concern for his well-being, as they suspected he might be facing abuse. Despite his young age, Nicholas showed impulsive behavior from an early age, leading to multiple encounters with the law. His juvenile criminal record included offenses like breaking and entering, theft, skipping school, and even making threats towards his teachers. Notably, he was also verbally and physically aggressive towards his mother. Due to his troubles, Nicholas had a court appearance on June 14, 1994, which could possibly see him placed in a group home. This transition would mean him sacrificing the independence he cherished. Understandably, this notion did not sit well with Nicholas. But fate had other plans. On June 13, 1994, 13-year-old Nicholas Barkley enjoyed a basketball game with his friends in his hometown of San Antonio, Texas. As he played basketball, Nicholas contacted his older brother Jason for a ride home. However, Jason declined, instructing Nicholas to make his own way back. With only $5 in his possession, Nicholas began his journey home, but he didn't make it. This mundane call was the last interaction his family had with him. That same day, Nicholas's mother, Beverly Dollarhide, reported him missing. Familiar with Nicholas's encounter with the law and his imminent court appearance, authorities initially treated his case as another instance of running away, expecting him to reappear within a day or so. Nicholas was reportedly dressed in a white shirt and purple pants and carrying a distinctive pink backpack. Therefore, the police thought that he'd be easily located and returned home. But they were wrong. In September of that same year, Jason, Nicholas's older brother, reached out to the police, claiming that Nicholas had attempted to break into their garage. Despite Jason's report, when the police arrived, there was no evidence of attempted burglary, nor any trace of Nicholas. The uncertainty surrounding his disappearance deepened, leaving more questions than answers. In 1997, after three years of being missing, a startling development emerged. Nicholas's family was informed that he'd been located in Linares, Spain. Nicholas's sister, Carrie, mustered the courage, aided by her employer, to journey to Spain, an experience that was her first trip abroad. Convinced that this person was her long-lost brother, she brought him back to San Antonio, warmly welcoming him into her home and even allowing him to share a room with her own son. Upon his return to the United States, Nicholas claimed that he was abducted by high-ranking government officials allegedly involved in an evil child sex ring. According to his story, these operatives subjected him, along with numerous other children, to abuse and experimental procedures that altered his appearance. These experiments purportedly led to the transformation of his blue eyes into brown and a change in his hair color to evade recognition. Nicholas also claimed that his new accent was from living in Europe for two years. Understandably, Nicholas's family was elated to have him back after such a long absence. However, upon reuniting, discrepancies emerged that cast doubt on his account. Despite the glaring differences in appearance, 
with their once blonde-haired and blue-eyed son now presenting as a brown-eyed brunette speaking with a French accent, the family's overwhelming joy overshadowed these surprising changes. Their desire to reunite with their loved one led them to overlook these concerning signals. However, the story didn't end here. Because of his miraculous reappearance, the media wanted to know how it all happened. Around November 1, 1997, shortly after the new Nicholas had settled into his new residence, a private investigator named Charlie Parker, who had an office in San Antonio, caught wind of the astonishing story surrounding the return of 16-year-old Nicholas Barclay and decided to investigate the kidnapping. Parker was in his late 50s at the time, and having harbored dreams of becoming a private investigator, Parker transitioned into the role only recently after spending three decades in the lumber and building materials industry. Parker swiftly traced Nicholas Barclay's whereabouts to Carrie and Brian's trailer. On November 6, 1997, accompanied by a producer and camera crew, Parker arrived at the location. Although the family had reservations about Nicholas speaking to the media, Nicholas agreed to an interview. Parker observed from the sidelines as the young man recounted his disturbing story. Parker replied, he was calm as a cucumber. No looking down, no body language, none. However, Nicholas's peculiar accent piqued Parker's curiosity. After looking at a photograph of young Nicholas Barclay on a shelf, Parker couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Recalling that ears are unique like fingerprints, he approached the cameraman and quietly requested, zoom in on his ears, get them as close as you can. Placing the photograph of Nicholas Barclay in his pocket, Parker returned to his office post-interview. Using a scanner, he transferred the photo to his computer and meticulously analyzed the interview footage. Parker closely examined the ears in both images. The ears were close, but they didn't match, he recalled. We put them in Adobe Photoshop. You know, people laugh about that, but he didn't have the same ear. Well, he couldn't change his ear. A plastic surgeon would have to tear the ear out. So I knew right away I had an imposter. Parker consulted ophthalmologists, eye experts, about the possibility of changing blue eyes to brown through chemical injections. Their consensus was negative. He also contacted a dialect expert at Trinity University who explained that even after three years of captivity, an individual would quickly revert to their original accent. Despite San Antonio police claiming that the returned individual was Nicholas Barkley, Parker shared his doubts with authorities. Concerned that a potential imposter was residing with the Barkley family, he reached out to Beverly, revealing his discoveries. Parker explained the inconsistencies regarding his ears, eyes, and accent. Parker's record stated, family is upset, but maintains that they believe it's their son. A few days later, an angry call from Nicholas followed, although he denied making it. Parker recorded in his files that Nicholas challenged, who do you think you are? When Parker expressed his disbelief in Nicholas's identity, Nicholas retorted, immigration thinks it's me, the family thinks it's me. Parker pondered whether to let the matter go. After all, he'd already alerted authorities and wasn't obligated to investigate further. Plus, other cases demanded his attention. However, the boy's French-tinged accent lingered in his thoughts, prompting questions about a foreigner infiltrating a Texas trailer home. I thought he was a terrorist, I swear to God, Parker recalled. Beverly secured a modest room in a dilapidated San Antonio apartment complex, and Parker began tailing Nicholas during his visits. I'd set up in the apartment and watch him come out, Parker recounted. Nicholas's routine included walks to the bus stop adorned with a Walkman and mimicking Michael Jackson's dance moves. After spending two months in the United States, Nicholas became increasingly moody and distant. He started skipping classes, prompting taunts from fellow students who teased him about his unusual accent. This resulted in his suspension. By December, he embarked on a solitary journey in Carrie's car, driving to Oklahoma. The police arrested him for speeding, but his family bailed him out from the police station and took him back home. Shortly before Christmas, Nicholas noticed his altered appearance in the bathroom mirror, his brown eyes and dyed hair. Angry, he grabbed a razor and cut his face. This act led him to being confined in a local hospital psychiatric ward for observation. Doctors eventually deemed him stable enough to return to Carrie's trailer, yet his anxiety continued. In the midst of these events, Doubts regarding Nicholas's account began to surface among the authorities. 
An experienced FBI agent, Nancy Fisher, interviewed Nicholas several weeks after arriving in the United States. The purpose was to document his claims of being kidnapped on American soil. I was pulling teeth trying to determine who would kidnap Nicholas, when and where and under what circumstances. I had almost no information because all the information he gave us was very, very general. He couldn't give names, he couldn't give places, he couldn't give times, he, could, he couldn't give anything. Fisher instantly felt suspicious, recalling, his hair was dark but bleached blonde and the roots were quite obvious. Charlie Parker knew Fisher and had already shared his suspicions with her. Fisher cautioned Parker against interfering with an ongoing federal investigation. However, their parallel inquiries led to a sense of collaboration and trust, with Parker sharing any important information he gathered. While Fisher delved into potential abductors and abusers, she found Nicholas's demeanor towards her peculiar, describing him as surly and uncooperative. Fisher's primary concern was getting to know who this new Nicholas who had entered the U.S. was. She recognized the impossibility of altering eye color and decided to seek expert help. Fisher arranged for Nicholas to see a forensic psychiatrist in Houston under the pretense of addressing his alleged abuse. The psychiatrist, based on Nicholas's syntax and grammar, concluded that he couldn't be American and was more likely French or Spanish. Fisher shared these findings with Beverly and Carey, but they remained resolute in their belief that he was Nicholas. Suspecting Nicholas might be a spy, Fisher reached out to the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, voicing her concerns and seeking assistance in identifying him. However, she recalls the CIA's response, stating, I was told by a CIA agent that until you can prove he's European, we can't help you. Fisher attempted to convince Beverly and Nicholas to provide blood samples for a DNA test. Both adamantly refused. Beverly, in particular, was vehement in her resistance, declaring, how dare you say he's not my son? Mrs. Dollar Hyde said, this is my son. I don't have to provide blood samples for you for DNA. And she lay down on the floor, literally lay down on the floor uh, and said, no, and you can't pick me up and you can't make me. By February 1998, four months into Nicholas's presence in the U.S., Fisher obtained warrants to compel their cooperation. She recollects Beverly lying on the floor, refusing to comply. Despite the resistance, Fisher managed to obtain their blood samples. She also acquired Nicholas's fingerprints, forwarding them to the State Department for a potential match with Interpol records. Meanwhile, concerned about Nicholas's self-destructive tendencies and instability, Carrie decided she could no longer host him, leading him to move in with Beverly in her apartment. During this time, Nicholas began to reevaluate his interactions with his family. On March 5, 1998, as authorities drew closer to arresting Nicholas, Beverly made an important call to Parker claiming that her son Nicholas was an imposter. Acting on this information, Parker met Nicholas at a diner the following morning, hoping to establish a relaxed atmosphere. They ordered hotcakes, and after nearly five months of his return, Nicholas Barkley was tired. Parker recounted how he informed Nicholas that he'd upset his mother, to which Nicholas unexpectedly blurted out, she's not my mother, and you know it. Parker pressed further, asking, are you going to tell me who you are? Nicholas's response was candid. I'm Frederick Bourdain, and I'm wanted by Interpol. My heart was beating fast, just like it is now thinking about it. And, uh, and I said, who are you? He said, I'm Frederick Bourdain, and I'm wanted by Interpol. Parker excused himself to the restroom and promptly contacted Nancy Fisher with the revelation. Fisher, who just received the same information from Interpol, urged Parker to stall Bourdain who'd been masquerading as Nicholas for almost five months while they worked on obtaining a warrant. Returning to the table, Parker sustained the conversation with Bourdain. As Bourdain recounted tales of his nomadic European life, Parker wrestled with some guilt for his role in exposing him. After about an hour, Parker drove Bourdain back to Beverly's apartment. Parker left, but Fisher and law enforcement were already en route to apprehend Bourdain. He surrendered without resistance. I knew I was Frederic Baudin again, he admitted. Beverly's reaction was less composed. Upon seeing Fisher, she exclaimed in frustration, what took you so long? Settle in tonight because we are about to share with you a story so bizarre it's hard to believe it's true. This is the tale of a master imposter who managed to lie his way into the United States 
and prey upon the most vulnerable of people. Frédéric Pierre Baudin was born on June 13, 1974, in Nanterre, France. Baudin's early life was marked by unique circumstances. Raised by his grandparents in Nantes, he ventured on a journey of independence, eventually finding his way to Paris. The absence of his father, an Algerian immigrant named Cassie, according to his mother, further added to the complexity of his upbringing and personal history. In October 1997, Frédéric Baudin found himself in a dire situation in Spain. Faced with the possibility of being exposed as an adult with a criminal record, he devised an audacious plan to evade capture, assuming the identity of a missing teenager. Baudin believed that if he could convince the authorities and the missing boy's family that he was indeed a teenager from the United States, he might escape legal consequences. His plan involved stealing the identity of Nicholas Barkley, a missing 16-year-old from Texas. In the middle of the night, Baudin hatched a plan. He called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in the U.S., using English he'd picked up during his travels and posed as a director of the Spanish shelter where he was staying. He described a frightened child who resembled him and asked if they had anyone matching that description. Astonishingly, the center suggested the missing boy might be Nicholas Barkley, who had disappeared in 1994. This unforeseen twist led Baudin to commit further to his deception. With a makeshift plan and an altered appearance, Baudin called the officer in charge of Nicholas Barkley's case, claiming that the missing boy had been found. Something in my head decided I could do it, that I had to try. I took the phone and I told her that this is Nicholas. We got him, it's, it's him. It's incredible, it's him. This marked the beginning of Baudin's attempt to convince the authorities and the family that he was indeed Nicholas. He fabricated stories about his appearance changes, concocting a narrative of abduction and experimentation that might explain his altered eye color. Now in custody, Baudin told another elaborate tale that was as imaginative as his Nicholas Barclay impersonation. He suggested that Beverly and Jason might have played a role in the real Nicholas's disappearance and that they were aware of his deceit from the start. Baudin's words were laded with irony as he acknowledged, I'm a good imposter, but I'm not that good. Before his disappearance, the real Nicholas had been living with Beverly in a modest one-story house in San Antonio. His older half-brother, Jason, age 24, had recently moved in after a stint with his cousin in Utah. Jason has a wiry build, long curly brown hair, and an ever-present comb tucked in his jeans back pocket. He bore burn scars from an accident at 13 when he accidentally set himself on fire while lighting a cigarette near gasoline. These scars created an enduring fear of isolation. Carrie remembered that Jason worried that he'd never meet someone and he'd always be alone. Despite his struggles, he displayed artistic talents, sketching portraits of friends and strumming Leonard Skinner songs on his guitar. Although he'd only completed high school, he was articulate and bright. Yet, he grappled with his own demons, frequently engaging in heavy drinking and cocaine use, traits he shared with his mother. After Nicholas's disappearance, Jason's behavior grew increasingly erratic. He was arrested for assaulting a police officer and Beverly expelled him from the house. According to Carrie, Nicholas's disappearance had a profound impact on Jason, leading him into a spiral of drug addiction. His family claimed that he was suffering from guilt because he didn't help Nicholas to get a ride home on the day he vanished. In late 1996, Jason decided to face his addiction and entered a rehabilitation center, ultimately succeeding in overcoming his drug dependency. Following his rehabilitation program, he remained at the facility for over a year serving as a counselor and working for the center's landscaping business. He was still there when Baudin appeared as Nicholas. He questioned why Jason hadn't met him at the airport and initially showed no eagerness to meet him at Carrie's place. After about a month and a half, Jason finally paid a visit to the new Nicholas. Carrie described Jason's demeanor as standoffish during the encounter. Although Jason hugged his brother in front of everyone, Baudin sensed an air of caution in his embrace. After a brief interaction, Jason asked him to step outside and extended a hand toward him, presenting a necklace with a golden cross. Jason explained that it was for him. Bourdain shared, 
It was like he had to give it to me. Jason placed the necklace around the new Nicholas's neck and then bid him farewell and never returned. Bourdain recounted, it was evident that Jason knew what had happened to Nicholas. For the first time, Bourdain began to ponder who was truly deceiving whom. After Bourdain moved in with Beverly, he noticed peculiar instances, like Beverly's reserved reception at the airport and Jason's reluctance to visit him. While Carrie and Brian seemed committed to believing he was Nicholas, disregarding blatant discrepancies, Nicholas felt Beverly treated him less like a son and more like a ghost. He alleged that during one episode while staying with her, Beverly, in a drunken state, had exclaimed, I know that God punished me by sending you to me. I don't know who the hell you are. Why the f*** are you doing this? Beverly couldn't recall such an incident, but remarked, he must have got me pissed off. Eventually, Frederick Baudin, the Nicholas Barclay impersonator, was charged in court. In September 1998, Baudin entered a guilty plea for passport fraud and perjury in a San Antonio federal court. He was handed a six-year prison sentence, surpassing the recommended duration outlined in the sentencing guidelines. After his sentence, he was deported to France. Upon his return to Europe in 2003, Baudin quickly resumed his fraudulent activities assuming various false identities of other teenagers. This pattern of impersonation led to his incarceration once more. Among others, he adopted the persona of Léo Bali, a 14-year-old French boy missing since 1996. However, even this elaborate transformation couldn't escape scientific scrutiny. DNA testing ultimately exposed the falsehood and he was sentenced to prison. In 2007, he married a French woman and reportedly became a father to five children. However, subsequent social media posts hinted at the potential dissolution of the marriage. A 2008 profile in The New Yorker revealed Bourdain's claim of being too famous, and he even boasted of adopting around 500 different identities, showcasing the extent of his deceptive endeavors. Despite ongoing efforts by private investigators, the case of Nicholas Barclay went cold leaving his whereabouts a mystery. Tragically, he's never been located and his fate remains unknown. Suspicion has surrounded his older brother Jason as a potential suspect in his disappearance. However, Jason struggled with drug addiction following Nicholas's vanishing and tragically passed away from a cocaine overdose in 1998. With his untimely death, the investigation hit a roadblock. To this day, Nicholas Barclay's case remains unresolved with law enforcement agencies often categorizing him as a runaway. The circumstances surrounding his disappearance and the lingering questions surrounding his family's involvement continue to perplex and haunt those seeking answers. In 2012, Netflix produced a documentary called The Imposter, highlighting Nicholas Barclay's and Frederic Baudin's story. Frederic Baudin once said, when you fight monsters, be careful that you don't become one. Perhaps Baudin couldn't defeat his monsters and decided to become one. Frederick Baudin's remarkable saga understores the complexity of human deception and the lengths people can go to assume false identities, even when it harms others. What do you think? Do you think that Frederick Baudin's sentence was adequate for his crimes? I'm willing to die. I'm willing to give up my life. Find out the truth on Burke. I can't live without justice for Burke. I can't go on with my own life. That's all I can think. I want justice. The morning of September 6, 1997 began casually for 19-year-old Brooke Baker, a student of journalism at Vincennes University, Indiana. Her investigation into a date drug used by some campus fraternity guys had caused some friction between her and the fraternity guys. Despite their threats, she was determined to expose their crimes, which earned her praise from her journalism teachers. On September 7, 1997, Brooke's 18-year-old brother, Braun Baker, stopped for a visit at her house off campus as he normally did. They had a strong bond, and he had a key to her home. But when he called out her name, he received no response. As he ventured deeper into the house, what he saw left him haunted forever. What did Braun Baker see in his sister's home that distressed him so much? Or was he just hallucinating? Today's story takes us to the historic city of Vincennes in Knox County, Indiana. 
Founded by French fur traders in 1732, Vincennes was the site of several important events during the American Revolution and the Northwest Indian War. Vincennes is also the oldest continually inhabited European settlement in Indiana and has a rich and diverse heritage. According to the 2020 census, the city has a population of 16,000, steadily decreasing since the 1990s. With its location on the Wabash River, the city offers a variety of recreational attractions to residents and visitors alike. Vincennes had a relatively high crime rate in 1997, with a violent crime rate of 514.6 per 100,000 people. It was this city that was Brooke Baker's home. Brooke Elizabeth Baker was born on April 24, 1978 in Vincennes, Indiana. She was the daughter of Janet and Maurice Baker. She grew up in a low-income family with her parents and younger brother Braun, but she never let that stop her from pursuing her dreams. Brooke's heart beat with a passion for words. From a young age, she dreamt of becoming a writer, using the power of storytelling to captivate and inspire. In August 1996, she embarked on a new chapter as she was accepted into Vincennes University, Indiana's oldest college. Brooke studied journalism and wrote for the campus newspaper, The Trailblazer. She was an ambitious and talented reporter and wasn't afraid to tackle controversial topics. Brooke was kind, loving, smart, knew what she wanted out of life. Brooke was also a friendly and outgoing person who made friends easily and enjoyed life. She was close to her family and often called her mother to chat and share her feelings. She hoped to transfer to a bigger university after completing her two-year program at Vincennes. Brooke was living with a friend and his roommates while attending university and was dating another student casually. But her main focus was her career as a writer. She wanted to cover hard-hitting stories for the school paper, especially about the fraternities on campus. They had a lot of influence and also a lot of scandals. No one doubted that Brooke had a bright future ahead of her, but little did anyone know that her zeal to cover hard-hitting stories would lead to a tragic outcome. In the spring of 1997, 19-year-old Brooke began working on an investigative story about an assault case that had happened at a frat house. The campus fraternity involved in the matter had covered up the crime. Some of Brooke's friends were in that fraternity, but they didn't want to talk about it. Brooke managed to identify the victim and tried to interview her, but the victim backed out after being pressured by the fraternity members. Brooke spoke to several women who had similar encounters with the frat members. However, the fraternity did not appreciate her probing into the case. They sent her threatening messages and emails, warning her to stop the investigation. However, Brooke was not one to be intimidated and continued her investigation, but her mother, Janet Baker, was worried about her well-being. Brooke assured her mother that she was pursuing the story to prevent others from being harmed. But the warnings continued. One time, Brooke was at a friend's place when a truck full of frat guys showed up and threatened her. Brooke's friends were concerned about her, and in July 1997, for safety reasons, Brooke moved to a new apartment off campus where the landlord was a campus cop. But come what may, she was determined to expose the truth and refused to give up on the story. On September 7, 1997, Brooke's 18-year-old brother, Braun Baker, visited her at her off-campus house. The siblings were very close, and he had a key to her place. He called her name, but got no reply. He noticed that the water was running in the bathroom and turned it off. He went further into the house, looking for his sister. But what he found in Brooke's house was a horrifying scene. Braun Baker, overwhelmed with grief upon discovering his sister's tragic fate, somehow managed to compose himself enough to call the police. When the police arrived at the scene, they found Brooke lying naked on a mattress in her bedroom. She'd been stabbed multiple times and bore bruises suggesting she'd been tied up and assaulted. There was no sign of forced entry in the house, but the injuries on her arms were enough evidence of a fierce fight between Brooke and her killer. I went up to a state policeman and I told him, I said, I'm going in there. He said, no, you can't go in there. That's my granddaughter in there, and I think I have a right to go in there. And he said, there's a lot of evidence in there, and we don't want nobody to move with it. The killer had tried to clean up the crime scene. A towel was in the bathtub, a bleach bottle and two dishwashing liquid bottles were on the floor. A soapy knife, suspected to be the murder weapon, was found in the kitchen sink. The police also collected a DNA sample from Brooke's body that did not belong to her. 
Brooke's vibrant future had met a horrifying end in her own home. Police were determined to give the young woman the justice she deserved. The forensics team sent the DNA sample from Brooke's body for analysis. They also collected other materials from the crime scene that would be useful in the investigation. The police began by questioning Braun, who reluctantly revealed that his sister, Brooke, had been romantically involved with another student. The police pursued the lead and were able to contact and question Brooke's boyfriend. According to her boyfriend, they'd attended a party the night before her body was found. Brooke had left the party early while he remained behind. The boyfriend's alibi, however, couldn't be confirmed due to the influence of alcohol on him and his friends while at the party. The police then reached out to Brooke's journalism teachers and peers, hoping to uncover potential suspects. During their inquiries, they learned about her investigative work regarding the campus fraternities. Brooke's friend told the police that the fraternity members were angry at Brooke for exposing their secrets. They'd left a threatening note on her door at the previous house, warning her to stop writing the story. The threats came in her first year of school, close to the end of the school semester. It was the fraternity. Determined, the police decided to question the fraternity members and possible witnesses. The police had three main theories about who could have killed Brooke. The first theory pointed to the campus fraternity members who were displeased with Brooke's investigation at Vincennes University. The police interviewed several fraternity members, including two of Brooke's friends who were in the frat. They all denied any involvement in Brooke's murder, but the police added them to the list of suspects. The list kept growing as the police continued their investigation. The second theory involved Brooke's landlord, who was also a campus police officer and had a key to Brooke's house. She told her friends and family that he'd often enter her apartment without warning or permission. One night, he'd shone a flashlight into her bedroom while she was sleeping. Another night, he came in while she was taking a shower. Brooke had felt uncomfortable and scared by his behavior. The police believed that he may have used his key to get into her apartment that night and killed her after a confrontation. There were also troubling allegations against him, as some women had accused him of voyeuristic behavior on campus. However, when the landlord was questioned, he refuted the claim of unauthorized entry, claiming that he'd entered for pest control purposes. He maintained that he'd been at work throughout the night when Brooke was murdered. The third theory pointed to an unknown suspect, a John Doe who had pretended to be a potential roommate. Brooke had placed an ad in the campus newspaper seeking a roommate, and the police believed that this John Doe may have seen it and contacted her. She may have let him in, thinking he's interested in renting the room, and then he attacked and killed her. This theory was supported by the fact that there was no sign of forced entry in her apartment. The police had the DNA sample of the killer, which they obtained from Brooke's body. They tested the landlord and Brooke's boyfriend, but neither of them matched the DNA, so they were eventually ruled out as suspects. Because John Doe was unknown and mostly a theory, there was no way to pursue him. As the investigation deepened, the focus shifted back to the fraternity members. Approximately 65 males willingly provided DNA samples. Regrettably, none of the samples matched the killer's DNA. There was no other physical evidence or witnesses to link anyone to the crime. The police even questioned Brooke's cousin, who'd lived with her for a while before moving to California one week before her murder. However, the cousin was uncooperative and refused to answer any questions from the investigators. The police didn't know what she knew about the case or if she was involved in it. The police were frustrated and baffled by the lack of leads. They wondered who could have killed Brooke and why. There were no witnesses to the crime and the DNA sample didn't match anyone in the criminal database. The police searched for the killer across different states and took DNA samples from many people, but none of them matched. Brooke's parents, along with other family and friends, were desperately hoping for answers, but the police were unable to find the murderer. The distraught family buried Brooke in Wheatland Cemetery in Knox County, Indiana. It was a sad day for the Baker family and the Vincennes community at large. Nevertheless, the family did not give up. They hoped that someone would come forward with new information or evidence that would help solve the mystery of their daughter's murder. Someone that's listening to me tonight has that answer concerning my daughter's murder. I'm willing to die. I'm willing to give up my life. Find out the truth on Brooke. I can't live without justice for Brooke. I can't go on with my own life. That's all I can think. I want justice. 
Despite all efforts, Brooke Baker's case soon went cold until the spring of 1999. On July 5, 1999, the police got a call about a missing student at Vincennes University and they rushed to the flat of 21-year-old Erica Norman. As knocks on the door went unanswered, the police felt a sense of dread. They broke in and found a scene of horror that was oddly familiar. It was a slaughterhouse that eerily matched another case. Erica Elaine Norman was born in Crawfordsville, Indiana on November 13, 1977 to Kenneth and Elaine Norman. Erica grew up in a happy and large family with three siblings and several nieces and nephews. She also adored her dog, Smokey. Erica was a standout student and her academic prowess was matched by her passion for extracurricular activities, such as softball, gymnastics, singing, and her involvement in the drama club, science club, and the Spanish Honor Society. Her enthusiasm for learning extended to exploring different cultures. At Vincennes University, she pursued radio and television studies, fueled by her passion for media and communication. While at college, Erica worked part-time jobs where her kindness and humor endeared her to colleagues. She treasured her high school, college, and sorority friends who loved her for her cheerful and caring personality. However, on July 4, 1999, Erica's life took a dark turn. That night, she was seen leaving a local restaurant with a stranger she met there. The next day, she was reported missing by her friends who hadn't seen her since the previous night. On July 5, 1999, when investigators arrived to reach Erica Norman's apartment, they were shocked to discover a nearly identical crime scene to Brooke Baker's. It was very strange. I walked in the door and took one tour around the apartment and I called Greg Winkler. And I said, you need to get over here. And I told him we have it again. I just knew. However, Erica's body was nowhere to be found. There was no sign of forced entry, yet the apartment looked like the scene of a violent struggle. There was blood splattered on the walls, a lamp that had been smashed, and a table that had been knocked over. A pair of shorts stained with blood were also lying on the floor. The bathroom was equally disturbing. The police found a bottle of bleach on the counter and couch cushions soaking in the bathtub. The water was still running from the faucet, just like it had been in Brooke's apartment. It seemed that the killer had tried to clean up the evidence, but had left in a hurry. The police learned that Eric had been at a bar called the Green Parrot the night before she disappeared. She'd been seen with a man named Brian Jones who'd bought her drinks and danced with her. The name Brian Jones carried an unsettling familiarity. It turned out that this very Brian Jones had been the roommate of Brooks's boyfriend at the time Brooke had been murdered two years ago. The police tracked down Brian and took him to the station for questioning. He was very agreeable and friendly. He confessed that he'd met Erica at the bar and accompanied her to her apartment to watch a movie. He claimed that Erica fell asleep on the couch and he'd left her apartment quietly. Brian seemed very cooperative with the detectives who were investigating Erica's disappearance. He agreed to give them his DNA sample and the clothes he'd worn the previous night with Erica at the restaurant. He also allowed them to search his car and house without any resistance. Brian had no criminal record. The police began searching for Erica's body and even sought help from the public. Two weeks after her disappearance, on July 20, 1999, Erica's body was discovered in a plastic tub in a cornfield in Lawrence County, Illinois. And a farmer was going by one of his fields and he walked into the field about 40 or 50 feet in and he found Erica. Based on the DNA evidence recovered from Erica's body, the police charged Brian Jones with killing her. The police also suspected that Brian held the key to unlocking a cold case from two years earlier, Brooke Baker's murder. Brian had left town shortly after Brooke was killed, but he'd returned in 1999. He was now the prime suspect in both murders, since the crime scene and method in both cases were disturbingly familiar. The police still had the unknown DNA sample they'd retrieved from Brooke's body. They decided to test Brian's DNA against it. The result was a perfect match. The police suspected that Brian had visited Brooke's house after a party. Brooke had let him in since she considered him a friend. However, Brian had another motive and tried to force himself on Brooke. When she resisted, he assaulted and killed her. He then tried to wash away the blood and DNA in the bathtub. Brian Jones was charged with the murder of Brooke Baker as well. In 2000, Brian Jones faced separate trials for killing Erica Norman and Brooke Baker. Brian confessed to murdering Erica but he pleaded not guilty to the assault and murder of Brooke. The prosecution presented a compelling case against Brian. 
showcasing evidence of arguments indicating his involvement in Brooks' murder. They demonstrated Brooks' whereabouts before her death, the presence of a knife with her DNA in the sink, and Brian's connections to her. Brian's party attendance on the night of the murder, a suspicious scratch on his face, and inconsistencies in his statements further raised suspicion. DNA evidence linked him to the crime scene, and his recent rental of a movie featuring a similar murder scene added to the case against him. However, Brian's attorneys claimed that the evidence presented was insufficient to convict him of murder. They argued that the evidence did not prove that he'd assaulted and killed Brooke Baker. There was no way to conclusively prove that the intercourse happened at the same time as the murder, that it was forced by him, or that he was the one who stabbed her. Brian's attorneys claimed that the evidence only raised suspicion and possibilities, not certainty beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecutors, however, disagreed and said that the convictions for murder and assault were supported by circumstantial evidence and the reasonable inferences that could be drawn from it. They highlighted the presence of Brian's DNA on Brooks' fingernails and intimate areas, the scratch on his face the day after the murder, and the similarity of the murder scene to a movie that he'd rented shortly before. Brian's attorneys claimed that the trial court wrongly excluded a statement that Brooke herself had made shortly before she was killed. The night before her body was found in her apartment, a friend had walked Brooke home and they'd seen her landlord drive by. Brooke had told her friend that she was scared of the landlord. The trial court had agreed with the prosecution's request to keep this evidence out, but Brian's team argued that this evidence should be allowed because it fits the present sense impression exception to Indiana's hearsay rule meaning that if someone sees something and tells someone else about it right away, their statement can be used as evidence even if they're not in court. On December 14, 2000, Brian Jones was found guilty of assaulting and killing Brooke Baker. The trial court, following the jury's recommendation, sentenced him to a life sentence without parole. He was also sentenced to 60 years for the murder of Erica Norman and got an extra 20 years for the assault conviction. Brian Jones is currently serving out his sentence in the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility in Sullivan County, Indiana. Brooks's father, Maurice Baker, was pleased with the sentence. We're satisfied. We know we have the right person, and maybe he won't be able to harm anyone anymore, he said. Putting a face to this animal helps a little bit. It will still be something that we will deal with the rest of our lives. He sat in that courtroom with no expression, stone cold, no remorse, being human. Sadly, Brooks' mother, Janet Baker, passed away in 2004. However, Brooks' brother, Braun, still fondly remembers his sister and the happy memories of growing up together. It's really hard to have a favorite memory of her because we were so close in age. All of my childhood memories involved her, he said. Brooke is also fondly remembered by her friends and teachers at Vincennes University. Michael Mullen, a former English and journalism professor at the university, described Brooke as a lively and ambitious student. When she was around, you knew she was there. Brooke was ambitious, fearless, and had a great personality. She wasn't afraid to approach people and loved to learn new things, he said. To honor Brooke's spirit and passion for journalism, the Indiana Collegiate Press Association, ICPA, created an award in her name in 1999. The Brooke Baker Indiana Collegiate Journalist of the Year Award is given every year to an Indiana college student journalist who's inspired to make a difference in the world with their writing. Justice can be delayed, but not denied. Brooke Baker's family and friends had to wait for two years before her killer was arrested and convicted. They had not given up on finding out who killed their beloved daughter and friend. Do you think that justice was served for Brooke Baker and Erica Norman? Do you agree with the court sentence, or would a death sentence have been more fitting for the crimes Brian Jones committed? We hope Brooke's story inspires you to stand for the truth and what you believe in. Let her story move you to stand strong in the face of injustice as she did. Jacksonville 911. Yes, sir. Hi. This is. Um, I. Uh, went out to play this this afternoon. I thought she was with her, and now she's missing. How old is she? She's eight years old. What's it's her name? short. Her name is Maddie. She goes, it's Natalie. What's her last name? Clifton. C-L-I-F is in Frank T-O-N. When's the last time anybody saw her? About 5.30 was the last time we saw her. 
and I was letting the kids play out here for a little while, and then she just she disappeared, and nobody knows where she's at. On November 3rd, 1998, eight-year-old Maddie Clifton mysteriously vanished from the street outside her home in Jacksonville, Florida. That was a safer time, and such crimes were unusual. So panic and concern spread like wildfire, compelling the entire neighborhood to unite in a desperate search for the little girl. However, there was one person in the search party who was pretending to look for Maddie, but was actually the one who had ruthlessly taken her life. But the killer could not hide the truth for too long. The details of the incident would shock the community and leave families reeling for years. So what happened to Maddie? Who had murdered her and why? Located in the northeastern corner of the Sunshine State of Florida, Jacksonville in Duval County is a vibrant and diverse city offering a perfect blend of modern amenities and natural beauty. With its stunning coastline, riverfront views, and a rich cultural scene, Jacksonville has something to offer every visitor as well as resident. As Florida's largest city by area, Jacksonville boasts a unique mix of neighborhoods, each with its own charm and personality. Its 875 square miles hosts about 970,000 people. From the historic streets of Riverside and Avondale to the bustling downtown area, there is always something exciting to explore. The locals, known to be warm and friendly, also take pride in their city's natural beauty. Jacksonville's lifestyle revolves around sports and recreational activities. Residents can often be found enjoying the outdoors and playing sports. It was what eight-year-old Maddie Clifton wanted to do that fateful evening when she disappeared. The afternoon of November 3, 1998 was a regular day in the Lakewood neighborhood of Jacksonville. Maddie, having returned from school, went to her neighbor's place and knocked at the door to see if her friend Joshua Phillips wanted to play. 14-year-old Joshua was up in his bedroom playing on his computer when he heard the knock, but his father had forbidden him from playing with the girl. Maddie's neighbor and friend, Joshua Earl Patrick Phillips, was born on March 17, 1984, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. His parents, Steve and Melissa Phillips, raised Joshua in a strict household, where the real control rested in his father's hands. Steve was a computer specialist by profession who had problems with drugs and alcohol. It made him violent towards Melissa and Joshua, so both mother and son lived in fear of him. Steve had strict rules for his son and didn't like it when other kids visited their home when he wasn't there. He especially didn't like young girls, and Melissa could never figure out why. Eventually, Steve decided to move the family to Jacksonville, Florida. Joshua had always been close to his half-brothers, Daniel and Benji, going to concerts and movies together. The move to Florida meant the boys would be separated. Even Daniel and Benji pleaded with their father not to take Joshua to Florida and split up the family, but their father didn't listen. Joshua had no choice but to leave his half-brothers behind and start a new life. However, Joshua had a talent for making friends and getting along with people. He was known to be a funny kid, always cracking jokes and making others laugh. So, shortly after moving to Florida, he managed to make new friends and was well-liked by his classmates. He was a ninth grader with a C average at Philip Randolph Academies of Technology, but he was passionate about sports. He especially loved playing baseball with other kids in his neighborhood. But not all of Joshua's playmates were boys. Through common love for sport, he met one of his regular baseball partners, Maddie, who lived right across the street. Madeline Ray Clifton, popularly known as Maddie, was born on June 17, 1990 to Sheila and Steve Clifton. She grew up in Jacksonville, Florida with her older sister, Jessie, during a time when kids had the freedom to play outside without worry. She attended San Jose Catholic School as a third grader. Maddie was a joyful and outgoing child, a bit of a tomboy who loved playing basketball for her school team. She also had a fondness for baseball. Together, 14-year-old Joshua and 8-year-old Maddie made a dynamic duo on the neighborhood streets, one pitching and the other swinging. The proximity of their houses helped them spend more time together and became friends, disregarding the six-year age gap. But Joshua's dad had given him a serious warning about staying away from Maddie, saying she was too young to be his friend. And he obeyed his father's words because he knew how angry and scary his dad could be. So on that day, November 3, 1998, around 5 p.m. when Maddie came over, Joshua was hesitant to play with her. 
But Maddie persisted until Joshua finally gave in reluctantly. His parents weren't at home, so Joshua decided to play with Maddie for a while and send her off quickly before his father came back. By then, the sun was setting on the horizon and they went outside to start tossing the baseball back and forth. The evening air was cool, but the atmosphere was tense. Joshua couldn't shake the feeling that he was doing something wrong, but Maddie seemed so happy to be playing with him. But as time went on, Joshua knew he had to keep his promise to his dad. It was around 6.30 p.m. when Maddie's mother, Sheila, called out to her and her older sister, Jessie, to come inside for dinner. 11-year-old Jessie came back inside, but she couldn't find her little sister anywhere. Sheila searched every corner of the yard, feeling increasingly worried. With no sign of Maddie as the sky darkened, Sheila rushed back into the house to call for help. She dialed 911 and reported that her daughter was missing. Jacksonville 911. Yes, sir. Hi. This is. Um, I uh, went out to play this this afternoon. I thought she was with. Her, and now she's missing. How old is she? She's eight years old. What's it's her name? Short. Her name is Maddie. She goes. It's Maddie. What's her last name? Clifton. C L I F is in Frank T O N. When's the last time anybody saw her? About 5.30 was the last time we saw her. And I was letting the kids play out here for a little while. And then she just she disappeared. And nobody knows where she's at. Within minutes, police units from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office were on their way to the Clifton House. Maddie's father, Steve, arrived soon after. The whole neighborhood was alerted and everyone joined the search for the young girl. With flashlights in hand, the community banded together determined to find Maddie. Police officers, neighbors, and friends combed the streets, parks, and alleys, hoping to catch a glimpse of the young girl. Joshua and his parents joined the search too. He seemed just as shocked as the other neighbors looking for Maddie. As the hours passed with no sign of Maddie, concern and anxiety grew in the community. Where could Maddie be? What could have happened to her? As the days passed, the search for Maddie intensified. The police worked tirelessly, going from house to house and questioning neighbors. They hoped that someone might have noticed something unusual or seen any strangers in the neighborhood, but there were no leads. The community conducted their own individual searches and put up posters with Maddie's face. All that the police had until then was that Maddie had disappeared. But it seemed highly unlikely that a child playing in a residential neighborhood full of families would disappear like that without anyone noticing anything. However, the fact was that people were not afraid to let their kids roam around and play at that time. They trusted their neighbors. So even if something strange happened, nobody would have noticed it until Maddie had cried out or shouted. So there was a high possibility of a known person luring her away. But who could have done such a thing? Was there any other possibility? As the police started interviewing people, their attention quickly shifted toward a neighbor who seemed suspicious. This particular neighbor had a history of being involved in two battery cases over 15 years ago, although those charges had eventually been dropped. Many believed they'd finally found the culprit responsible for Maddie's disappearance. However, the police couldn't link him to Maddie in any way, and it soon became clear that they targeted the wrong man. What the police didn't suspect was that the real culprit was hiding in plain sight, living just around the corner from Maddie's family. The children in the neighborhood were deeply affected by Maddie's disappearance and struggled to understand what had happened to their friend. Police took turns interviewing the kids in the neighborhood. They also spoke to Joshua, who seemed equally upset and had no information to share. Several flyers were distributed and a $50,000 reward was promised to anyone who could provide useful information about Maddie. Then, on the morning of November 10, 1998, the mystery took a shocking turn. Joshua went to school as usual, and his mother, Melissa, kissed him goodbye. She then went about her daily chores. She needed to tidy Joshua's room and had been hesitating to do it, given how stressed Joshua was about Maddie's disappearance. However, she knew it was time to do so because his room had a strange smell. Entering her son's upstairs bedroom, Melissa thought she saw the source of the problem. There was a small puddle at the foot of Joshua's waterbed. She thought that perhaps the spilled water was causing the stench. She grabbed one end of the mattress and peeled it back from the baseboard. Almost immediately, she let it go and took a step back. Then she was turning and running, down the stairs and out into the street where she found a police officer. 
there was a human foot poking out from under Joshua's waterbed. In no time, police cars flooded the Jacksonville neighborhood and sirens were wailing in the street outside the Phillips house. As the investigation unfolded, authorities found more gruesome evidence in Joshua's room. Hidden within the confines of his seemingly ordinary bedroom were the remains of eight-year-old Maddie. She was found unclothed from the waist down. Officers swiftly cordoned off the Phillips residence with crime scene tape to control the growing crowd. Among them were Sheila and Steve Clifton, who had just wrapped up an interview with a media channel. They were anxiously wondering what was happening and praying it had nothing to do with their daughter. The truth was finally revealed when a police officer approached Sheila and escorted her back home. She knew something was wrong. The police officers took Maddie's sister, Jessie, to IHOP, a pancake restaurant chain. And that's when the officer told Sheila that Maddie's lifeless body had been discovered hidden under Joshua Phillips' bed. Well, if you look behind me, this is the home where Josh Phillips lived. That far right window was his bedroom where Maddie Clifton's body was found under his bed. Just across the street is where Clifton's home was. Her sister just moved in. And I remember walking in to the IHOP and seeing a, a missing person's um, poster on the on the window walking into the the family was in disbelief which quickly turned to anger and grief how could someone they'd known someone who'd played with other children in the neighborhood be capable of such a heinous act sheila stated that joshua and her daughter had been friends and she had no reason to fear him or believe that he could have done this to her as the news spread the residents couldn't believe how a young teenage boy could kill a child and stay quiet about it for so long Police officers had checked the Phillips residence three times earlier and even interviewed Joshua in his room, but had failed to notice anything. The smell of the corpse had been masked by the multiple birds that the Phillips family kept as pets. The most disturbing part was that Joshua had been sleeping on the same bed for an entire week, knowing very well that under it lay the corpse of an innocent girl who was once his friend. He'd even participated in the search to find her, when he clearly knew she was lying dead in his own room. As CSI units combed the scene, a patrol car raced towards Joshua's school with an urgent mission. They needed to bring him to the local police station for questioning. Inside the station, detectives sat him down in the presence of his parents as he was only 14 and underage. Joshua knew he couldn't deny his involvement in Maddie's death, so instead he weaved a tail. According to Joshua, Maddie had come to his door, excited to play a game of baseball together. He reluctantly agreed, fearing what his father would say if he found out. But as they played, an accident happened. His powerful swing made the ball strike Maddie in the face, causing her to cry out in pain. Fear surged through him as he realized the severity of the injury. She was bleeding from a gash above her eye. Joshua wasn't supposed to be playing with Maddie. And now he'd not only defined his father, but also hurt her. He knew his father would be home soon, and facing his wrath terrified him. In a moment of panic, he decided to carry Maddie to his room, hoping to soothe her and keep her quiet. Joshua explained that he dragged Maddie to his room, trying to hush her cries. Despite being dragged on the ground like that, the bottom part of her clothes had come off. Maddie was continuously crying and bleeding. He didn't want to get into trouble, and he certainly didn't want Maddie's parents to know it was his fault Maddie had been hurt. So instead, he made a decision that would change everything. He hit her on the head twice using the baseball bat and used his pocket knife to stab her throat. Joshua didn't want anyone to find out that he'd accidentally hurt Maddie, so he intentionally killed her. Then, considering the job done, he hid Maddie's body under his waterbed, desperate to erase all evidence. At that time, his father Steve returned home. Joshua interacted with his father for some time and came back to his room. He found that Maddie was still alive and moaning in pain. Worried that his father would hear her, Joshua pulled her out, slit her throat open, and stabbed her in the chest. This time, Maddie went still. He pushed her body under the mattress once again and went out of the house to join in the search to find her. But little did he know that his terrible secret would soon be exposed. And what was even worse, the detective suspected Joshua was lying about his motive. 
Joshua had claimed that everything started because of an accident. Ironically, that was the biggest flaw in his story. The ball that he claimed hit Maddie in the face had no traces of blood on it. Even the yard was clear of any blood traces. The autopsy report revealed the details that Joshua had tried to hide. Maddie hadn't been stabbed just twice, but a total of nine times, of which seven stab wounds were on the chest. The cruelty of the attack was unimaginable. Not only that, the autopsy uncovered yet another truth. Maddie had suffered a blow to her head so powerful that it fractured her skull. And the most devastating revelation of all was that Maddie had still been alive when Joshua had hidden her under the bed. The pain and fear she must have endured was unbearable to think about. She would have waited for someone to come and rescue her as she was taking her last breaths. Joshua could only say that he'd spent the previous week in complete denial. He just assumed that nothing happened and was believing that theory. It was his defense mechanism since childhood, and he claimed he did not intentionally choose to ignore the incident or the severity of it. While Joshua said that, his father, Steve, placed some of the blame on Maddie herself. He believed that if the girl hadn't come over, none of it would have happened. I'm here to announce the arrest of Joshua Earl Patrick Phillips. On the same day, November 10th, 1998, Joshua Phillips was charged with first-degree murder. Given the severity of the crime, it was decided he'd face trial as an adult. However, the trial was moved from Duval County to Polk County in Florida due to publicity concerns and to avoid judicial bias. On July 6, 1999, the first day of the trial, the courtroom was packed due to the intense media coverage of the case. Joshua's defense team, headed by lawyer Richard D. Nichols, stuck to the same story he told the police. However, the prosecution presented a different theory. They believed it was a sexually motivated crime. Even though the autopsy found no evidence of that sort of assault, Maddie's body was found unclothed from the waist down. The police discovered that Joshua had been looking at violent images online just before the murder, raising suspicions that it might have influenced his actions. Maddie's sister, Jessie, testified that Joshua had in the past spoken to her and Maddie about adding weight to the prosecution's argument. State attorney Harry Shorstein also said that no dirt or sand was found on Maddie's clothes to suggest that she'd been dragged. Throughout the trial, the defense sought to present crucial evidence to support Joshua's case. They presented brain scans taken by a neurologist, revealing bilateral lesions on the frontal lobe of Joshua's brain. These specific brain abnormalities have been linked to panic responses and impaired judgment. They contended that the lesions might have influenced his decision-making and emotional responses, possibly contributing to his panicked reaction during the tragic events surrounding Maddie's death. Joshua's lawyer, Richard D. Nichols, said in his closing statement that Maddie's death was an act that began as an accident and deteriorated through panic that bordered on madness. The jury deliberated for only two hours before finding Joshua Phillips guilty as charged. He couldn't get the death penalty because he was under 16. So on August 20th, 1999, the judge handed him a life sentence in prison without the chance of parole. This decision was upheld on appeal in 2002. It was a very emotional day today for two families after Josh Phillips, Maddie Clifton's killer, receives a life prison sentence for the second time. So the Supreme Court decision ruled it unconstitutional to impose a life sentence on juveniles. So Phillips, now 33 years old, was granted a resentencing hearing, but once again he was sentenced to life in prison. Presently, Joshua Phillips is serving a sentence at the Cross City Correctional Institution in Dixie County, Florida. In 2012, there was a glimmer of hope for him when the U.S. Supreme Court declared that sentencing juveniles to life without parole is unconstitutional. As a result, a new sentencing hearing is currently pending. While behind bars, Joshua Phillips made a statement. She was a little girl who did not deserve to die. Joshua knew what he'd done and decided to spend most of his time pursuing education. Despite being told he was too young, he successfully completed his General Education Development, or GED, tests. He even went on to take college classes through correspondence. Behind prison walls, Joshua also found purpose in helping others. Working as a paralegal, he assists fellow inmates with their legal appeals. Additionally, he serves as a tutor, guiding fellow prisoners on their educational journeys. 
He plays guitar in a band and has also found solace in religious practices, participating in Christian services, zazen, and yoga. He's playing uh, guitar in a rock band. Uh, he phones me up now and, and, and says, can you get on YouTube and play Green-Eyed Lady by Sugarloaf <laughs> so I can see if I got the guitar part right? I mean Over time, Joshua has earned recognition for his positive behavior and demeanor while incarcerated. Even during his 2017 appeal, the prosecution acknowledged him as a model prisoner. Despite his personal growth, some wounds remain unhealed. In 2008, Joshua declined to write a letter of apology to Maddie Clifton's grieving family, stating that he believed they deserved an in-person apology to truly see his sincerity. However, Maddie's mother, Sheila, expressed no interest in meeting with him. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for what happened. I applaud him for being able to get up and do what he did because I know that was hard. Forgiveness is not in my hands. I am a Christian. I believe in God. And I feel like at the end of the day, it is not my, that's not my job. Outside of prison, both the families continue to deal with tragedy. Following the trial, Maddie's parents eventually got divorced while Joshua's father, Steve Phillips, passed away in a car accident on June 27, 2000. As of the latest available information, Joshua Phillips, now 39 years old, continues to serve his life sentence in Cross City Correctional Institution. His journey serves as a poignant reminder that actions can have lasting consequences, and the path to redemption is often paved with difficult choices and personal growth. The loss of a young life is always a devastating blow, as it leaves behind a void that can never be filled. While justice was served with the conviction of Joshua Phillips, it can never undo the pain and heartache that Maddie's family and the community endured. It prompts us to consider the importance of early intervention and mental health support for troubled teenagers. It also emphasizes the need to foster a compassionate environment in the house that nurtures its young members. Even though Joshua was the one who committed these violent acts, it cannot be ignored that his father was not a great role model, especially when he could blame an eight-year-old victim. Irrespective of Joshua's motives, do you think Steve Phillips was somehow responsible for teaching his son that violence was the key to all problems? Do you believe Joshua's story? Belle Gunnis, the Black Widow of the Midwest, a woman who loved her husbands to death, a woman who brought death wherever she went, a woman who some believed was a man in disguise. Some consider her caring, others called her evil. Despite differing opinions, everyone believed one thing. She was the most degenerate female serial killer in U.S. history. Active in the early 1900s in Indiana, her victims included men, women, and even children, with no cap on the age limit. Despite being a religious woman, her name soon became synonymous with horrible sins and a spree of murders. But who were her victims? And what made her claim the lives of these innocent people? Was it a personality disorder or a sinister greed that consumed her? Located in northwest Indiana, La Porte is a rural city with a population of around 22,000. Established in 1832, the city was located on a trail connecting the forest to the prairie that was used by French explorers and fur traders. It was named La Porte, meaning the door in French, to symbolize its importance as a gateway. In the 19th century, La Porte became a prominent summer destination with its scenic water bodies and picturesque landscapes, including Pine Lake and Fish Trap Lake. As the city continued to grow, it preserved its natural beauty, industrial prowess, and a sense of tradition. With a rich 150-year history, families have lived in La Porte for generations, and many residents have deep roots in the region. There is one story that all people here know by heart, a tale that has been told and retold through generations. That is the story of Belle Gunnis. Brynhild Paulsdatter Storseth was born on November 11, 1859 in the small fishing and farming village of Enbigda on the eastern coast of Lake Selbuzio in Norway. She was the youngest of eight children born to Paul and Berit Storseth. Her father was a poor sharecropper and stonemason who struggled to provide for his family. They lived below the poverty line and even received poor relief from the government. Her early life in Selbu garnered different opinions. Some people, like the religious pastor of the community and a local farmer who employed her, remembered her as well-behaved. Others considered her evil-minded and prone to lying, with extremely unattractive habits. 
As a child, she earned the humiliating nickname of Snurkvistpala, or Paul's Twig Daughter, due to her task of collecting twigs to light fires. It was a direct sign of the family's inability to afford proper firewood. Due to poverty and bullying, her childhood was a hard one. By 1874, she had grown into a tall and masculine-looking teenager. She started working as a cattle girl on surrounding farms. Her responsibilities included herding cattle to mountain pastures during the summer months and tasks like milking cows, making butter, and tending to the animals. Nobody could deny that she was a hard worker, but the hardships of being a poor girl did not ease. In 1877, when she was 17, a painful and life-changing event occurred. After being confirmed in the Evangelical Lutheran Church, she discovered she was pregnant, causing scandal and shame within her family. It was not easy for society back then to accept such news. As her family struggled to cope, another shocking incident followed. At a country dance, she faced unwanted advances from a wealthy local man. When she resisted, he violently attacked her and she lost the child, forced to suffer a traumatic experience at a young age. Authorities in Selbu did not prosecute the man, but he later died under mysterious circumstances from a stomach ailment. Hardened by suffering, she emigrated to the USA on the steamship Tasso at age 21. Her destination was listed as Chicago, and occupation as servant girl. Her older sister, Nellie Larson, who had already emigrated and married in the city, sponsored her journey. She arrived in the U.S. on September 8, 1883. That was the start of a whole new journey for Brynhild, who changed her name to Belle after her arrival. In 1884, Belle married a Norwegian man named Maud Sorensen in Chicago. He worked as a department store guard, likely earning a steady working-class income. Soon, tragedy stuck when their home in Chicago burned down. The Sorensons used the fire insurance money to buy a confectionery store. However, the store also fell victim to a fire even before a year had passed. Bell claimed that a kerosene lamp had caused the fire, although the lamp was never found in the debris. Despite this, the Sorensons received the insurance money in 1886 and used it to purchase their own house on the outskirts of Austin, a wealthy Chicago suburb. The couple, who had lived in shabby apartments for years, now had a lovely home to spend their whole life together. However, fate had something else in store. Mods began working for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad, earning $12 to $15 a week, but Bell was keen to have kids and wanted to expand the family, even with the meager income. Nellie Larson, Bell's sister, became aware of Bell's intense interest in children when her daughter Olga stayed with her aunt for six weeks. When it was time for Olga to return home, Bell proposed adopting the girl, which shocked Nellie and led to heated arguments. After the disagreement, the sisters stopped communicating for years. Nellie was suspicious of Belle's motives. She said, My sister was obsessed with money. It was her greatest weakness. There was some truth to this, as Belle indeed seemed to prioritize material wealth over any man's companionship. Even while living with her husband, Belle would often say that she was only staying with him for financial security. Even so, her intense obsession with children resulted in her adopting kids who were rejected by their families or born into extreme poverty. Due to the trauma she had experienced in her youth, Belle couldn't bear children herself, so she adopted a baby girl, Caroline, later followed by two more girls, Myrtle and Lucy. But nothing about her story was simple and direct. Rumors in Austin at the time suggested that her main business was operating a baby farm, involving the buying and selling of infants. It seemed too far-fetched the rumor until the sudden arrival of baby Axel in the Sorensen home. Belle claimed the child was her own son, but Dr. J.B. Miller, who rented space in the house, found the circumstances close to impossible. He received a strange note asking for immediate assistance for Belle's delivery, which was a shocker because nobody in the community had guessed she was carrying a child. When Dr. Miller rushed to her aid, he discovered her with the infant already. Belle said she couldn't find the doctor anywhere, so she had taken someone else's help. However, this mysterious helper was never identified, but this was not the only suspicious case. There was another incident involving an infant appearing suddenly and then mysteriously vanishing. Even as the neighbors discussed the sudden strange birth of Axel, a new incident emerged for their speculations. The Sorensen's Austin house also burned down in 1898, and once again, Bell was there to collect the insurance money. The pattern was simple. The houses kept burning down and the money was always claimed. This continued with two more house fires. In the midst of all this, Bell lost two of her four children. Caroline died in 1896 and Axel in 1898. Both infants showed symptoms of acute colitis, which could be triggered by poisoning. Everything to do with Belle and her family was starting to raise suspicion, but what was really creepy was that her children had been insured as well. 
so Bell claimed and received money for Axel's and Caroline's death. On July 30th, 1900, while living in their newest house on Alma Street, and after 17 years of marriage, Mad Sorensen died under suspicious circumstances. The date he died was the exact same one when two of his life insurance policies, one ending and another just beginning, coincidentally overlapped. Dr. J.B. Miller attended to Mads and observed symptoms of strychnine poisoning, but Bell claimed Mads had been sick and had taken a powder for his cold. With no autopsy conducted, his death was ruled to be from natural causes. The fraternal associations linked to Mads' insurance policies awarded Bell $8,500. She became a serious suspect when Mad's relatives claimed he was poisoned, citing the quick collection of the money as a motive. An inquest was ordered, but Mad's body was never exhumed for unknown reasons. Incidents of this kind could never stay behind closed doors in a close-knit community, and stories and rumors traveled like wildfire. Surely not all those fires could be accidental, and not all those deaths could be coincidental. Different people had different views of Bell. Some saw her as an arsonist and poisoner, giving her the infamous title of the Black Widow of the West Side. With her plain looks, overbearing nature, and masculine appearance, she was believed to be possessed by evil forces. The nonstop gossip even influenced local children, who taunted Bell's kids. However, Josephine Birkeland, a close friend and Austin resident, saw a different side of Bell. She had witnessed Bell caring for a local girl named Jenny Olson, who was eventually adopted by Bell as her daughter. Belle was also seen tending to her other daughter, Myrtle, when she fell ill. Mrs. Birkeland highlighted Belle's warm smiles, friendly demeanor, and deeply religious nature. While Belle had been a do-gooder during her earlier years, a different side of her character had emerged after marrying Mad Sorensen. This change was seemingly motivated by a desire for wealth. But Belle did not care at all about people's opinions. Despite the scandalous rumors, she used Mad's life insurance money to purchase a pig farm on the outskirts of La Porte in Indiana but the twists in the story were far from over. Before leaving for her farm, Belle took her foster daughter Jamie and her two children, Myrtle and Lucy, to visit her cousin's dairy farm in Ottertail County in west central Minnesota. There, she rekindled her connection with Peter S. Gunnis, a widower she had previously known in Chicago. Peter had two daughters from his earlier marriage and was looking for love and companionship. Peter had even lived with Belle for a while and paid her rent in Chicago when Maud Sorison was still alive. However, this reunion did not sit well with Gunnis' relatives. Peter's brother Carl said, We knew he was afraid of the woman, and we thought her influence over him was too great for us to prevail. Despite objections, Bell and Peter made their way together to Laporte, Indiana, and got married in 1902. They became a blended family of seven, with Bell's three daughters and Peter's two daughters. Within a week of this marriage, however, tragedy struck the household. When Peter was out of the house, his infant daughter died under mysterious circumstances. Once again, death seemed to be lurking everywhere Belle went. The townspeople of Laporte were struck by Belle's extraordinary strength and looming physique. They likened her to a female Paul Bunyan, an American and Canadian folk hero and lumberjack. Now, that was not a compliment, really. It was more of a concern, a suspicion. Belle had a large and bony frame, square jaws, and black eyes, which made her stand out as lacking typical feminine features. People found her large, grotesque hands unnerving, especially when she worked as a butcher at the farm and expertly carved up pig carcasses. She was often seen wearing a man's fur coat over her house dresses and a sealskin cap during winters. Belle always wore a leather belt with pouches and knife sheaths, carrying various carving and paring knives ideal for cutting up bodies. Probably just farm animals. Rumors started circulating in the port that Belle Gunnis might not be a woman at all, but a man in disguise. Could it possibly be a man making use of feminine charms to gain money? Could this explain why her husband seemed scared of her? Could it have been a warning about a criminal in the making? About nine months after Belle and Peter's marriage, Peter himself died from a skull injury on December 16, 1902. Belle claimed that Peter had been sitting near the kitchen stove and reaching for his shoe when the movement had dislodged the shelf above him, causing a sausage grinder and a stone jar of hot water to fall and smash his skull. But people were skeptical about his so-called accidental death. Belle had the strength of a man and could have used that strength to smash her husband's head. Peter's family was equally suspicious and took custody of his older surviving daughter to keep her away from Belle. Although a coroner's jury suspected foul play, no charges were brought against Belle. Her luck continued, and she again collected insurance money, this time around $3,500 for Peter's death. 
As neighbors began to take notice of the activities on the farm, their suspicion deepened, especially when Belle gave birth to Philip Gunnis in 1903. She was 44 years old at the time, yet she was seen chasing the pigs around her farm and engaging in heavy chores a mere two days after birthing Philip. To reassure her neighbors and to shut down rumors, Belle explained that she had called a midwife to help in the delivery. However, the midwife had a different story to share. She said that when she reached the house, Philip was already washed and clothed, and he was not the size of a newborn infant. Belle seemed to have loved her two husbands to death, probably even causing their demise. But in reality, she only had one true love. Money. After Peter's death, her farm had everything except for a man. Several men came and went, and Belle told her children that they were just cousins. Each of these cousins would bring a hefty trunk and then disappear soon after, leaving their trunks behind. Belle was in need of a partner with whom she could share the labor on the farm. But in early 20th century America, the options for finding companionship were limited. With none of the apps and luxuries of the modern world, people relied on natural encounters and traditional methods. For Belle, placing ads in newspapers seemed like the most practical solution to her problem. Belle started placing her marriage ads in 1905 in Norwegian newspapers like Skandinavien, Minneapolis Tidande, and Decora Posten. The carefully crafted appeal described her as a comely widow and proud owner of a large farm in the finest district of LaPorte County, Indiana. She wrote that she desired to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided with the view of joining fortunes. But there was a catch. She had explicitly mentioned that no replies by letter would be considered unless the sender was willing to follow through with a personal visit. The black widow was laying a trap. In a letter to Carl Peterson of Wisconsin, one of the many respondents to her ad, Bell expressed that she had received as many as 50 responses in total. She wrote to him, I have picked out the most respectable, and I have decided that yours is such. She might have worded her emotions in the style of the famous author Jane Austen, but Bell was not interested in love. In her letter to Peterson, Bell hinted at the possibility of a financial arrangement. Now, if you think that you are able in some way to put up $1,000 cash, we can talk matters over personally. It was all about money, and probably something more sinister and dark. However, Peterson did not have this kind of money with him, and so he avoided going to the farm. Another man named John O. Moe from Minnesota responded to an ad in 1906. After exchanging letters for months, he left for Laporte with a substantial amount of cash from his bank account, but he vanished without a trace. A carpenter working for Bell at the time noticed Moe's trunk among more than a dozen others at her house. In the next several months, many suitors continued to make their way to the Indiana farm, lured by Bell's ad. This included old widower Ollie Budsberg from Wisconsin. But nearly all of them would mysteriously go missing, never to be seen again. In addition to suitors, Bell Gunnis needed help on her farm, so she hired various men as helpers. Much like her suitors, these helpers also vanished mysteriously. Olaf Lindbow, Henry Gerholt, and George Berry were among those who arrived at the Laporte farm and disappeared without a trace. But Ray Lamphere, a 37-year-old man from Indiana, had a different story. Hired in June 1907 for carpentry work and odd jobs, he became intimately involved with Bell, despite their age difference of 10 years. She even proposed marriage to him and asked him to take out a life insurance policy with her as the beneficiary. Although he refused, they remained on good terms. Lamphere was loyal to Belle and held her secrets close to his chest. Respecting her wishes, he never tried to access her mysterious secret room on the second floor. That was where all of Belle's secrets were laid bare. Whenever Lamphere was drunk, which was almost all the time, his bold and daring side would be unshackled, leading him to boast about having control over Belle. He said, I know enough to make her get down on her knees to me. However, when sober, his facade of bravado would melt away. The truth was that Lamphere himself was in a precarious position. Bell was not an amateur and had quickly become privy to some of his own dark secrets. Lamphere had a history of being a bigamist, having deceitfully married multiple women scattered across the country. Among them was a heartbroken woman from Pennsylvania who had sought the aid of a private detective, George Roman, to track Lamphere down. This gave Bell leverage over Lamphere, creating a strange dynamic between the two. Belle lived in a constant state of concern over what Lemphere might reveal about her activities on the farm, while he grappled with the knowledge that she held incriminating information about his past. It was a parasitic, toxic dependence. In the depths of Ray Lemphere's troubled and alcohol-fueled mind, a sinister paranoia took root, convincing him that Belle Gunnis was conspiring to end his life. 
This irrational jealousy intensified when Andrew K. Helgeling, a bachelor farmer from South Dakota, arrived in Laporte on January 2, 1908, determined to win Belle's heart and pay off her mortgage. Lamphere resorted to eavesdropping on their conversations by digging a hole in the floor to listen to the pair from his position in the cellar. However, his irrational beliefs did not end there. Lamphere feared that Belle might try to commit him to an asylum to silence him, knowing that he held damning secrets that could send her to the gallows. With Andrew's arrival, Belle coldly dismissed Lamphere from her life, firing him from the position of farmhand on February 8, 1908. Fearful of Lamphere's potential retaliation, she sought a peace bond from the court against him, unaware that her cunning scheme was about to fall apart. Andrew's disappearance soon sparked concern among his family, especially his brother, Asley. Unconvinced by Belle's excuses and stories, Asley relentlessly pursued the truth, refusing to accept her seemingly friendly replies to his inquiries about his missing brother. The deep-rooted suspicions and persistence of Andrew's family marked the beginning of the dramatic unraveling of Belle Gunness' sinister web of deceit and death. After Ray Lamphere's departure, Belle Gunness hired Joe Maxson to take over the farm chores. However, Lamphere continued to lurk in the shadows, keeping a watchful eye on Belle's every move. His presence filled her with anxiety and dread. Belle grew increasingly uneasy as Lamphere persisted in his harassment allegedly trespassing on her property and damaging the fence in an act of spite. The police, who could not capture Bell after so many incidents, arrested Lamphere on March 12, 1908, and he was fined a mere $1 for the offense. Bell filed another complaint on March 28, 1908, further escalating the tense situation. Meanwhile, Andrew's brother Asley was becoming increasingly suspicious. The clock was ticking, and the walls were closing in on Bell. Bell, allegedly fearful for her life, visited a lawyer and updated her will, leaving her estate worth $13,000 to her children Philip, Lucy, and Myrtle, while excluding Jenny for unknown reasons. No one in Laporte had seen Jamie since 1906, when Bell claimed to have sent the older girl to a boarding school. Little did anyone know that Bell's last will, drawn up earlier in the day, was about to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. On April 27, 1908, the Gunness household appeared to be in a cheerful and festive mood. The house was well lit and filled with laughter as the children played a game in the parlor. Belle joined in, portraying the role of a devoted and caring mother one last time. She sat on the floor, laughing and singing along with the little ones, and almost cried when the bad fox managed to catch Little Red Riding Hood. Finally, it was time for bed, and the Gunness house retired for the night. At 4 o'clock the following morning, on April 28, 1908, the new farmhand Joe Maxson was abruptly awakened by the smell of smoke engulfing his room. He initially thought Belle was downstairs preparing breakfast, but soon realized that the entire house was on fire. In a panic, he called out to Belle but got no response. The thick smoke and raging flames made it impossible to go looking for Belle and her children. Maxon fled outside and frantically threw bricks at the windows in an attempt to alert them, but to no avail. The fire rapidly consumed the entire building, and despite his efforts, no one could be saved. Ray Lemphere was also awake at that hour and on the move. He had spent the previous afternoon in Laporte and had found a place to rest for the night. Shortly after 4 in the morning, he left the location where he had stayed and started walking toward the Wheatbrook Farm, approximately 6 miles away from the Gunness Farm. He noticed the fire and smoke, but did not stop to help Maxon or alert the neighbors. Instead, he kept walking, afraid that he might be suspected of setting the fire if he remained in the vicinity. Within minutes, the Gunness Farmhouse and its surrounding structures were reduced to ruins, with debris scattered everywhere. The fire had caused the floors to collapse, leaving only fragments of the brick wall standing. The destruction was so horrifying that it was difficult to determine the fate of Belle Gunness and her three children. Sheriff Smutzer and his team began the daunting task of searching through the charred remains, hoping to find traces of Belle and the children. Over the next 24 hours, volunteers worked tirelessly to clear away the debris that had fallen into the basement of the burnt farmhouse. They had already completed around three quarters of the task when they made a grim discovery. The headless corpse of an adult woman was located in the northeastern corner of the cellar. They also found the body of Philip Gunness, wrapped in a blanket and resting on her chest. The bodies of the two girls, Lucy and Myrtle, were placed on either side of the headless corpse. The arrangement of the victims immediately raised suspicion that they had been deliberately positioned in that manner before the fire engulfed the house. Sheriff Smutzer, who was determined to unravel the mystery, believed that the skeleton belonged to Belle Gunness, but the ferocity of the flames might have burned off her skull. However, Belle was known to have gold fillings in her teeth, and teeth are extremely resilient and difficult to destroy. 
The absence of any teeth or gold fillings in the first dig suggested that someone might have intentionally removed the head of the corpse. Local authorities continued to dig deeper into the rubble, but despite their efforts, they could not locate the missing skull. The mystery of what truly happened to Belgunas deepened with each passing minute. The remains of the headless woman and the three children were taken to the morgue, where coroner Charles Mack conducted the post-mortem examination. Back at the farm, Louis Klondike Schultz, a former miner, was hired to sift through debris to look for gold fillings. On May 19, 1908, a section of dental bridge work was found. Bell's dentist, Dr. Norton, confirmed it was Bell's dental work. A four-man coroner's jury was assembled, and they gave their verdict. The headless body was identified as Mrs. Gunnis, and the other bodies were confirmed to be her children. The cause of death was determined to be suffocation followed by burning, and there was no evidence of gunshot wounds. The jury attributed the mutilation of the woman's body to the fire. However, Dr. Harry Long, who had assisted in the post-mortem, disagreed with the jury's conclusions. He pointed out that the body in the morgue was 5 inches shorter than Bell Gunnis and weighed around 50 pounds less than her actual weight. He stated that the body was of a rather plump woman with a similar contour to Bell Gunnis, but weighing between 150 to 160 pounds, while Bell had weighed 225 pounds. Dr. Long also observed that the fingers of the corpse showed signs of careful manicuring, while Bell's hands were known to be rough and calloused. Investigators suspected Ray Lemphere's involvement in the case. He was arrested and charged with arson and murder. During his arrest, he was found wearing an overcoat that had belonged to John O. Moe, one of Bell's former suitors who had gone missing. Additionally, Lamphere had a watch that belonged to another of Bell's missing suitors. Asley Helgeline, the brother of missing suitor Andrew, arrived at the Gunnis farm on May 1, 1908, determined to find answers about his missing brother. Acting on information from Joe Maxson, Helgeline began digging in the soft ground approximately 35 feet from the ruins of the burned house, which were the pens used to keep the pigs. Bell had told Maxson to dig post holes in that area so she could dump some rubbish. Local Laporte officials initially opposed Helgeline's actions, accusing him of causing trouble, but he was undeterred. Eventually, Helgeline's persistence paid off with a shocking discovery. In the depths of the soft soil in the pig pen, he unearthed a burlap sack that contained human remains, including a headless torso, legs, and feet. Asley Helgeline had stumbled upon the first evidence of the gruesome crimes that had taken place on the Gunna's farm and the body in the burlap sack was none other than his brother, Andrew. As the day progressed, four more badly decomposed bodies were uncovered, containing all types of human remains, often with loose flesh that dripped like jelly. Each body was wrapped in gunny sack cloth and had been dismembered. The bones exhibited signs of being crushed at the ends, as if they had been struck with hammers. It was also apparent that quicklime had been scattered over the victims' faces and remains to further disfigure the bodies. Among the remains was Bell's lone missing foster daughter, Jenny Olson, which explained why she had been omitted from Bell's will. The bodies of Ollie Budsberg and John Moe were also unearthed, and their relatives were called to make positive identifications. By the third day, even more victims had been discovered in what was now referred to as the Gunnis Graveyard and Murder Hill. Indeed, Bell Gunnis' sinister modus operandi involved luring unsuspecting men to her farm through personal ads. Once they arrived, she would manipulate and deceive them, separating them from their money. Bell was a skilled poisoner and used strychnine as her weapon of choice. It was commonly found in rat poison. When ingested, strychnine would inhibit the victim's reflexes and lead to a horrifying death from painful convulsions, muscle spasms, and asphyxiation due to the paralysis of the body's breathing mechanism. Bell did not just kill people, she took pleasure in watching her victims suffer and die. Her killings, it seemed, were not only driven by financial motives, but were also intensely personal acts of hatred and revenge. After the victims died, Bell dragged their bodies down to the cellar of her house for dismemberment. In this chilling chamber, she butchered the bodies using knives from her leather holster, which she usually used for slicing pork bellies. The room was strictly off limits to everyone except Bell herself. One of her daughters, aware of her mother's crimes, had even admitted to a friend that Bell had killed her father. Within the murder farm, the remains of her victims were concealed in various ways. Body parts were wrapped in gunny sacks and buried in shallow holes. To hasten decomposition, Bell would pour quicklime over the bodies and sometimes add cane and bricks to speed up the process. One farm worker named Greening recounted that he and other men had been instructed by Bell to dig up large tree stumps on the property and fill the holes with soft dirt. Unbeknownst to them, these holes were used to dispose of the human body parts she did not feed to the overweight pigs and chickens on the farm. 
While 10 to 30 men were known to have fallen victim to Bell's murderous schemes, it is widely believed that the true number was much higher, possibly reaching 40. Due to limitations of forensic technology at the time, getting conclusive evidence was challenging. Besides, Bell's calculating methods and manipulative tactics made it difficult for anyone to ascertain the full extent of her killing spree. The horrifying reality slowly sank in for the Laporte community as they realized that their odd neighbor, Bell Gunnis, had actually been a mass murderer. The excavation of bodies at the Gunnis property became a morbid spectacle that captured the attention of the nation. 13-year-old Glenn Ott, who skipped school for three weeks to witness the excavation, recalled his bewilderment at the disturbing events unfolding before his eyes. The small town of Laporte was suddenly a hub of visitors and curious onlookers. Hamburger and ice cream stands popped up to cater to the influx of visitors. Chicago, being the closest major city, went into a frenzy over the news. Carloads and trainloads of people descended upon Laporte, even on holidays and Sundays, to be a part of this unbelievable and gruesome spectacle. It was as if a morbid fascination had taken hold, with some even bringing picnic lunches to eat while bodies were still being unearthed. People from neighboring areas and even other states held on to the desperate hope that their missing loved ones might have fallen victim to Bell's sinister tactics and would finally be found, providing closure. However, the shocking and terrifying nature of the case also had devastating consequences. News of the gruesome murders, unearthed bodies, and Bell's twisted crimes spread far and wide, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Reporters from Warsaw, Indiana revealed that 70-year-old Jacob Pouch had tragically taken his own life on May 10, 1908. He was described as temporarily deranged after reading newspaper accounts of the Gunnis graveyard. The severity of the murders left many people distressed and mentally traumatized. Sheriff Smutzer had doubts about the circumstances of the fire. He believed that someone had intentionally started the fire after entering the house through the front door. Joe Maxson added that an oil can that usually stood in the outside hallway was missing, further supporting the theory of arson. But more pressing were the questions about the happenings on the farm. How was Bell getting so many gentlemen callers? Could she have run this racket alone? Were there any accomplices? Many people came forward with their own versions of stories. One person claimed to have asked Bell's assistance in murdering his wife. He shared many details with the police, which were never made public. Yet, he later confessed that he made everything up and his wife was actually alive, as confirmed by her relatives. But then, how did he know those details? A Cleveland man named Fred Halley claimed that an unidentified man had approached him, trying to lure him into Bell's trap. The mysterious delivery of five large trunks, dispatched by an expressman from Chicago to Bell Gunnis' vast 48-acre farm in Laporte over six months, gave rise to another chilling theory. Some speculated that Bell might have been running a macabre clearinghouse of murder, orchestrating the demise of wealthy men in Chicago, stuffing their lifeless bodies into these trunks and sending them down to Indiana for burial. While the theory had its flaws, it was difficult to overlook the eerie behavior surrounding these trunks. Bell had guarded them with an intense possessiveness, refusing to let anyone else handle them. She had, in fact, instructed workers to discreetly transport the trunks to her secret room on the second floor in complete darkness. In November 1908, Ray Lampshire was found guilty of arson related to the fire on the Gunnis farm. During his trial, Lampshire confessed that Bell Gunnis had placed deceptive advertisements to attract male companions, only to murder and rob them when they arrived at her farm. He also claimed that the body believed to be Bell's was actually that of a victim she had chosen to mislead investigators. According to Lamphere, the impending visit of Andrew Helgeline's brother had prompted Bell to destroy the house, murder her children, fake her own death, and escape. However, the story took a turn as Lamphere later made another confession. He claimed to have killed Bell Gunnis himself. The inconsistencies between the two confessions, along with the uncertain fate of Bell Gunnis, created a cloud of mystery surrounding the case. While serving his sentence at the Indiana State Prison, Lamphere contracted tuberculosis. On his deathbed, he confessed his involvement in the crimes to a fellow inmate named Harry Meyer. According to Meyer's recollections, Lamphere admitted to setting the fire and driving Bell to the railroad station. He also said that the burned and headless female body was not Bell, but a housekeeper she had hired a few days prior to the fire. The truth surrounding Bell's fate remained shrouded in mystery. Countless reports of possible sightings of Bell from different parts of the country emerged over the years, yet none could be substantiated. Bell had withdrawn a significant portion of her bank funds just before the fire, adding to the frenzy of speculation that she had faked her death and escaped with the money. In 2008, an attempt was made to exhume the female headless body and identify the victim using DNA samples. 
However, the samples collected from the crime scene in 1908 were ruined due to age. No conclusion could be made about what happened to Bell. Bell Gunnis was named in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the modern murderess with the most victims. Over time, Bell Gunnis' story transformed into a legend. From the unsettling disappearance of numerous men and the heartbreaking death of all the children in her care, to the gruesome revelations of her deadly actions, the truth behind her deeds may never be fully known. The echoes of her crimes continue to reverberate through time and have become a significant part of Laporte's history. Even to this day, the local county museum has a permanent exhibit on the Black Widow who gave the city such notoriety and drew crowds of visitors. Though the case may never be closed definitively, we must remember the victims whose lives were cut tragically short and seek solace in the hope that Bell could not claim any more lives. Do you think Bell staged her death or did she end her life knowing the walls were closing in on her? What according to you is more possible? Ray Lamphere killing her or helping her escape? Let us know your thoughts. Also, we would love to hear from you. If you want us to cover a case, please mention it in the comment section below. And do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. Until next time, stay safe.